Let me. Hello and welcome to Grumpy Old Midgard. Today we are joined by a wonderful darknisher who's getting her headset sorted out. Uh, let's see, there's a hand at the proof. Well, you can't see because I'm putting the <laughs> thing on there. But um, there is a hand. Um, in fact, sure. there is the hand. The hand of. Ah! Oh no! It's a dead one of these! Um, yes. Uh, we're it's also joined that by ben uh, <laughs> the wenchiest of wenchies, Game Daughter. Hello. Uh, Midgard Zombie, aka Laka. Hi, hi. Or Death, uh, yes. if you know him on Xbox. And of course, the two rotating purple circles of Discord, also known as Master of Corn. Um, Summer of Corn. If you have not gone and checked out any of these people, please do. They are all awesome. Oh, look, not Summer of Corn. That winter. does not look like Summer of Corn at all. No, um, I'm trying to figure out my, my camera. I get it on I, my I didn't. Page. I didn't realize that you were a, a, a buxom lass with red hair. Summer. I guess so. Right. Hey, good. Oh, joy. You have, oh, a, you have a handsome voice. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, turn that off. Today, we are going to be discussing um, video games that we would like to see not remastered because remastered is shit we want completely remade from the ground up games that might be from our childhood they might be games that came out today and just suck destiny to um they could be lots of interesting games out there that people might be interested in seeing them. and we're going to discuss them and we're going to give each one a score out of 10 for how much we think we might enjoy it and then we'll have like a league table at the end each person will give it a score out of 10 and we'll have a league table at the end that um causes a big white thing that says notepad to pop up on the screen <laughs> um that will uh total up to see you know whether uh you know the the top three and then on the the top three we'll take those put them onto twitter and um bombard the companies that own the rights <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. and say this is what we want done fuckers do and then now. they have to do it and they have to do it they have to because it's the rules um <laughs> because clearly we're the most important group of people in the universe uh -huh. No one agree disagreed. Cool. I didn't. Have, I, I, yeah. All right. All right. So he's using the word "people" very loosely there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just writing down the uh, the names. Anyway, so the I guess I will introduce the games first. Like yeah. um, the ones that I wanted to talk about was uh, Black and White, Might and Magic, and Outcast. Uh, uh, Nitty wanted to talk about Phantom Crash, Morrowind, Deus Ex, the first one. It's not Mankind Divided. Not the other ones with... Invisible what, what's Wars. What's it? The pre-Invisible pre Wars. Yeah. Um, and Enchanted Arms. Um, we had uh, the Wonderful Game Daughter, which were the ones you wanted to talk about. The Legend of Dragoon and hmm. Two Humans. Cool, cool. Uh, Mr. Death. Mr. Death, are you there? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, it was the Legacy of Kane series, um, possibly Stubbs of Zombie 2, which is not made, and the Manhunt series. Okay. And Summer Corn, I believe uh, you had two games you wanted to talk about? Yeah, uh, two. I say old school. Old school to me. Um, the Suffering series one and two. Mm -hmm. the Suffering was great. It was a great and series. The uh, what was it? Spec Ops the uh, line. Yes, Spec Ops the line. It's a uh, yeah, yeah. It's like the tenth in the series of the game. <clears throat> the line's the tenth in the series, but it's one of the newer ones. Mm. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that one announced at E3. Many many years ago, and uh, seeing some of the footage from it, um, I never actually played it though. But I did I did see it at E3, and I was like, oh yeah, that looks the graphics are really good on that. 
like for the time the graphics yeah. were very very good um and i have a few screenshots of the various things now i'm going to start off in uh alphabetical order because that seems appropriate somehow um and i'm not going to be looking at you i'm going to be looking over here because i have things prepared i've done my research you see so well i did my research so um we'll start with black and white uh black and white uh is a god simulation video game developed by lionhead studios and published by electronic arts for microsoft windows in 2001 by Feral Interactive in 2002 for Mac OS. Black and White combines elements of artificial life and strategy. The player acts as a god, whose goal is to defeat Nemesis, another god who wants to take over the universe, aka Putin. I mean, um, the primary theme is the concept of good and evil, with the atmosphere being affected by the player's moral choices. The core gameplay mechanic of Black and White is the interaction between the player and an avatar creature who carries out the player's instructions and whose personality and behavior change in reaction to how they're treated. There was multiplayer. Never played it. Never had anything to do with it. Um, didn't know anybody else who had the game. So, hmm. um, Peter Molyneux, who is a complete arsehole, um, uh, led the three-year development of Black and White um, uh, uh, with the idea of it originally featuring wizards rather than gods. Um, but he's a moron. Um, it was written from scratch, and the intention was to have the main user in interface free of icons, buttons, and panels. Um, they did try to make versions for game console at the time, but then they just cancelled them because um, Peter Molyneux is an asshole. Um, Black and White received universal acclaim, in inverted commas, universal. Um, it was actually panned quite heavily. Um, but it was also um, a lot of companies were like, oh, this is amazing, they've used AI, isn't it smart intelligent? So good! Um, and there were, but there were a lot of issues with the game. Um, it's still considered one of the most successful games of all time for the budget that was spent on it. Um, because they had a very small team dedicated to making a game that was quite well received and quite successful so it's um reviewers praised the artificial intelligence uniqueness and depth although the system requirements and bugs were criticized black and white won awards from several organizations including the british academy of film and television arts and the guinness world record for the complexity of the artificial intelligence selling over two million copies later re-reviews of the game considered it to have been overrated at the time but it was nonetheless considered one of the greatest games of all time. Um, you, uh, the, the, to give you a basic rundown, you start off, you enter existence, um, how all gods are created, um, and you start off on an island, and you get assaulted by Nemesis. Um, and Vladimir Putin comes along and kicks the shit out of your town. I mean, um, Nemesis comes along and kicks the shit out of your town because he's an arsehole. And you have to fight him. And uh, you lose. And you get almost immediately destroyed. So you jump through a portal, escape, and then have to build up and become strong and become incredible. Um, you have to uh, look after... You, you come across people people have town town is they don't believe in gods they don't believe in a god and you do something they go oh my god you must be a god we love your face please let us worship you and you go oh okay sure um uh the player interacts with the environment via an animated on-screen hand that is used to throw people objects tap houses to wake their occupants cast miracles and perform other actions such as picking up creature poo and throwing it around like your finger finger painting with poop Nearly every action, or lack thereof, affects how the player is judged by their followers. The player may be seen as a good god, an evil one, in between the two, or as some kind of weird Picasso who paints with poop. The land interface, including the hand and music, changed according to that alignment. A good god's temple is brightly coloured, while an evil god's is designed to look intimidating. 
It's not necessary to consistently perform actions of either alignment, and a mixture of the two can be used to stay neutral. The player has two advisors, one good and one evil, who try to persuade the player to do things according to their alignment. And if you did anything to annoy the um, evil advisor, who I think I have a picture of here, um, he would stick his naked red butt up against the screen and wiggle it about. Um, he was a real child. Um, it was great. Um, very much enjoyed it. <laughs> um, you had important tasks to, in expanding villages, constructing buildings, increasing the number of villagers, getting them to fuck. I mean, um, putting them together and then them going into a building and producing babies at a baby-making machine. Um, it was... Uh, you had houses, village centre, which displayed who's, which god controlled it and stuff. You had the village store, which stored resources rather than NFTs, um, like certain Ubisoft companies would like you to have in your stores. Um, buildings are created in the workshop after obtaining blueprints, wonders, and special buildings, granting special benefits. The villagers belong to one of eight tribes, such as the Norse, the Celtics, the Japanese, and so on and so forth. The game was split up over several levels, with the general goal of the level being to gain control over every village on an island, accomplished through making villagers go, Oh my god, he throws poo around like a god! Um, which was um, the usual method. They can be swayed by everything from assistance with day-to-day -day tasks to being terrorised by fireballs and lightning storms. Artifacts, such as special objects that grow and glow in the owner's colour, and missionary disciples can be used to impress villagers. Villagers became bored with repetitive attempts to impress them. For example, if boulders fly overhead too frequently, the effect is lost. Uh, this forces the player to use multiple methods to convert, convert a village, such as throwing poo at their fields to fertilise them. One of the main aspects of the game was the creature. And, uh, for everyone in Discord, you're not going to get to see this, but the creature was this big, fluffy-looking fella. Uh, and you could pick, at the start, you had four. You had a monkey, a lion, a wolf, and a coo. And you could pick uh, one of the four, and they all had different minor traits and things. Um, but the uh, creatures... Uh, uh, was the core functionality of the game, the core interaction between the player and the, uh, the, the universe as such. Um, you could get you could go around and do certain tasks and you'd unlock more scrolls which gave you access to more creatures if you so choose. Um, the currently owned creature can be swapped with a new one at certain points in the game. The creature starts out small and grows as the game progresses. Each has strengths and weaknesses. Apes are intelligent and proficient at learning but lack strength. Tigers are strong but learn slowly. And the cow and the wolf are somewhere in between. As a god, the player can teach their creature to perform tasks such as stocking the village store or performing miracles or throwing poo at villagers or even eating poo should your creature annoy you. Um, the creature is taught what and when to eat, how to attack or impress enemy villagers. Fighting skills may be taught in one-on-one -on -one battles with other creatures. Attack and defense abilities can be improved. Teaching is performed using reinforcement learning system. If the creature does something the player does not want, it can be discouraged with a slap, which always made you feel like shit, because it was such a cute little thing, and you were sitting there going, No, don't do that! Smack, 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 smack! And so you always felt really guilty about beating them. Or, um, uh, several, if you're a cruel bastard, you could beat the shit out of them multiple times, just for the fun of it, if you wanted. Um, if the creature does something the player approves of, they could be stroked or tickled. It, it even featured a, please don't touch my no-no spot animation for overzealous ticklers, um, the creature remembers the response to various actions and gradually changes its behavior accordingly with time and repetition. Um, and it would, you had three different collars you could use. Um, one was specifically for learning, one was to make your, your creature all dove-eyed and lovely and, hey, I want to do things to impress people. Or you could put on the spiky collar and say, murder, and they'd go, Brr, and start beating the shit out of stuff. Um, and you could sort of leash them to buildings and they'd do stuff appropriate to that building, like picking up poo and throwing it into the food stores of the people repeatedly, even though you told them not to. Um, uh, Microsoft bought out Lionhead Studios in 2006 um, and own 
all of their IPs, including Fable and Populous and Black and White. Um, the game was had strong critical reception with very high average review scores, although later reviews kind of pushed that down a little bit. It was still well in the 90s, even with the later reviews saying, it's not such a good game after all. Um, the, it had novel gameplay combined with God Sim, artificial life strategy games to make a very compelling game, and the original title had a highly open-ended game design. Like, there was no right way to do it. If you wanted to be an evil god, you could be an evil god. You could walk around and go, bow before your god, and all the creatures would be like, oh, boo, boo. Um, while it had many areas for improvement, creature, I could be in, creature AI could be infuriating if you accidentally tickled instead of slapped or vice versa. The amount of times that my creature would eat poop, then throw villagers, um, throw up on villagers, was rather higher than I'd wanted for most of the game. The game engine graphics being brought up to modern standards and changing almost little else would make for a very enjoyable and surprisingly model, modern feeling game. I think the power of the cloud and introducing co-op throughout the game, as well as expanding on the limited universe, would take the game to a level far exceeding the rose-tinted glasses, as with many retro games. I think that if... I was to pick a dev to redo it. I'd like to see the group behind Age of Empires concentrate on the strategy element. The try and get the original group from Lionhead because they're still about. They're still working in a lot of the Microsoft studios. I'd like to see them brought back in and rehash Lionhead Studios, bring that back around. Um, but I'd like to see Playground Games do the graphics. Um, I think it would be a really impressive looking game uh, with that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Playground Games, if they brought in, you know, the Forza's beautiful vistas, um, you know, and took the quite barren and sparse looking game that it was, um, I mean, you did have grass, but it absolutely came to your CPU. Um, you did have trees, uh, you, you know, the, the, the creatures did have somewhat fur on them, uh, and things like that, uh, but you could zoom right out of the island and zoom right into the island. Um, uh, it was a very pretty game at the time, but I think if they updated it and brought it up to modern standards, it would be incredible. Um, that was black and white. Next one is Deus Ex. Okay. Um, sorry, I just realised I hadn't put the date down when it was. Uh, okay, so uh, it was produced by Iron Storm and published by Eidos Montreal in June two thousand. Uh, first um, released on Microsoft Windows. Um, it takes place during the twenty uh, first century, century where. Uh, human, human augmentation is strong, strong and during, at, during this time, this time there, are there are various uh, secret organisations and uh, fighting, fighting to take full control, full control of the world. Of the world. Uh, uh, what made this game, this game what, 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 made what made this game interesting to me was, was uh, human, uh, human augmentation has always been, been something, something I have believed, believed in. in. And um, as you will, as you will learn, learn later on in the game, it 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 has honed in on the conspiracy theories of today, and just and just worked on making them um seem visually. If that makes any sense, mm -hmm. um. It involves around uh, your character, who's called J.C. Denton. Uh, uh, he, works he works for, for he works, he works as a rookie agent, agent United for United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition. Coalition. Now, now, the world, the world right, in right in the game is under siege by a, by a nanovirus, nanovirus called the Grey Death. Death. Uh, uh, he gets uh, uh, pulled into. Uh, a, world, a world, as I said, as I said of secret organisations and rival factions that caused, that caused the epidemic. epidemic. And, and he, in his, 
uh, uh, journey, journey he will have, have to choose, choose between causing, causing the world to fall, to fall into, into a second dark age, dark age or leading it into more of an AI-involved AI future. future. Mm. Now, it's not just an RPG, it involves first-person shooting and there's a lot of stealth tactics involved. You can augment your body to um, either just shoot your enemies when you see them or you can use stealth to avoid being seen or do the whole assassin type thing. Uh, but you can also augment your body to do both FPS first person shooting, shooting and stealth, and stealth. Um, um but what you pick will will affect how the npcs will see, will see you and which factions which factions you pick, you pick. Hmm. uh the uh the reason Deus why Deus Sex came to be is the the producer one specter he wants, he wants to create, to create a, um, a um, science fiction game that, that drew you in and made you, made you actively think about the options you pick. You pick. No, he, wanted he wanted to, to show you that there's nothing, that there's nothing sorry, sorry to use black and white, but there's nothing black and white, but there's nothing black and white in, mm -hmm. in the decisions you make. It's always a grey area. area. Um, now, his now his idea of the game, of the game at the time was called Troubleshooter, Trouble but he'd been rejected, rejected by the company he was working for, which was which Origin, Origin System, and another company called Looking Glass Studios. Glass Studios. It, was it wasn't until Iron Storm, Storm took an interest in it uh, that he loved his idea so much that, that they told him to, they, 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 they used these words, create, create the game of your dreams. dreams. And so he and did. So he did. Um, um, now, now I thought, I thought the, best the best company who could remake this, this um, would be, would be Digital, Digital Extremes, Extremes because, because I like how, how they worked, worked on Warframe, on Warframe and, I and I think that they could bring that enthusiasm to remake Deus Ex. Hmm. Who was it owned the, own it now? Uh, it, it is Square Enix. Square Enix. They, uh, yeah. Square Enix took over. I just Montreal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and they they've effectively killed it for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really shitty, considering how well the two newer games did. Um, yeah. yeah. And I would like to finish the Dare Sex, Mankind Divided, and mm. the uh, mm. other what, Human Revolution. Mm. I'd like to see that finished. <gasps> but yeah, that is my hmm. um my choice. Okay. Um the next one is Enchanted Arms. <laughs> so it's you again. Okay. Uh Enchanted Arms, uh it was produced by From Software in two thousand six for the three sixty. It was then released following the following year for the PS2. PS2. PS3, sorry, PS3. Uh, it's, it's a turn-based turn RPG, and the game uses long and short, and short attacks, and it takes place on a grid layout. layout. Mm. Um, your character, Atsuma, uh, he, he, is, he lives in Yokohama City, and he's studying, studying with his friends, Toya, Toya and Makoto, at the Enchanted University. University. Mm. He decides, he decides on the day of the, the, day of the festival, festival to skive, aka okay, okay, skip classes. classes. But while but they're, they're there and having fun, an earthquake, an earthquake rips, rips through the city. Uh, they, uh, return they return to the university to find out what's going on. And, and uh, while they're, they're they, found, they, find they find that this once, this once sealed, sealed ward that's off and off shoot somewhere from the off the university is now open. He and his friends. As they're, As they're going through, through the, the um, open, open doorway, doorway they meet they something called the Devil Golem. golem. And, this particular and this particular Devil Golem, golem is called, called the Queen of Ice. Now, during, now, during uh, uh, the fight the with the, with the, the Queen of Ice, Toya is kidnapped, kidnapped by her, and Makoto, and Makoto is, is pinned under falling, falling ice that she caused. 
At Super Ben goes on an adventure to try and save his friend. Uh, but during these adventures, he meets uh, new friends and new golems. Mm. He also finds information about his mysterious right arm. Uh, each person that he meets uh, has different abilities. And he's also able to collect golems that will work with him against the Queen of Ice and other enemy golems he meets. His friends and the golems have their own backstories. And it was where I had found that out and how the golems interacted and looked that endeared me to them. Three golems in particular, uh, Primrose, Sasquatch and Tiemtops. <laughs> They're very close to my heart, those three. Uh, mm. The game is very in-depth, and at the time of release, it was graphically stunning. Even now, as a backwards-compatible game, I am still awestruck about how good it looks. Um, I think that the graphics are uh, uh, stunning as they were on the 360. For its time, it, there was, it was crystal clear. Mm. Um, now, for a company to remake it i would like to see from soft software from software remake, remake it they did such, did such a great job, job on the original, the original game. game i think that, that it's only fair to see them, see them remake, remake it, it into the into glory, the glory that, we'll that we'll see now yeah okay and the next game on the list is legacy of cain oh snap <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, little disclaimer i was kind of preoccupied playing for a trip i didn't get to do so this is gonna be more mm. off my head than rooted mm. with um good back in back information but legacy of kane series i first heard about it on playstation one the first game and it was very different than what became of the series uh crystal dynamic Dy dynamics was involved with it doing it that was you know their game going but mm -hmm. what's funny was that when i was younger playing games i used to use this series as a reference of what style of gamer i was because if i was comparing myself to it i was more the blood omen group mm. because it was more visceral action-packed um style play whereas mm -hmm. the soul reaver series was more kind of puzzles and you kind of thought more and there wasn't as much action there was more thinking with it which is kind of funny so that's how i used to tell people which kind of gamer i was mm. um it had uh it had a series going with raziel's story and you had kane's story and they kind of met up at the end of it and there was a conclusion to it that left all this opening for the story and then they just didn't continue it after that there was a game they released on Steam called Nazgoth. It was not a continuation of that story. It wasn't even done by Crystal Dynamics, and it was a uh, it was a multiplayer um, game where you fought people. And I think the basis was they took the pillars from mm. the story because it was all based on the pillars. And I think you were aligned to a certain pillar, and you would fight for that pillars creator or something but they never mm. actually released that game fully okay but um i would really like them to redo it because i mean crystal dynamics did go and they redid the two meter series you know with a pretty mm -hmm. good job they did and to see them go back to do like a see a game and just kind of make the sense i mean make the story more cohesive to each other and fine tune it would be awesome mm. try and get some more consistency between the stories and crossover between them yes yeah. so like yeah because there was a lot of different ideas about stuff and if then if they redid the series it would they could still use a lot of story but fine soon it would be awesome mm. cool who owns the rights to that one still crystal dynamics is it i believe they do but i'm gonna because i was looking at it right and they had actually i i think square enix owns it mm. Since since 2017, the Legacy of Kane series has been available for for external developers to license through the Square Enix Collective service. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's Square Enix on the rights. Okay. Cool. I guess we move on to which one was the last one you played, Summer? <clears throat> I'm trying to think. I think it was Soul Reaver. 
uh, all I can remember about it is you can switch between a dead world or whatever and the yeah, world. Yeah, like uh, you were tasked with collecting souls for the who you thought was on your side. It turns out he's like the main enemy at the end of the series, and you yeah. would go between and. Mm -hmm. And then for Kane, it was funny because Kane in uh, Blood Omen was just kill your next enemy, gain his power, use that power to destroy your next enemy, gain his power. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. I love that. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, next one would be Legend, Le Legend. Legend <laughs> of Dragoon. Legend. Legend. All right. mm. Uh, okay. It, production started in 1996 and lasted three years. Okay. Um, I wrote down the cost for 16 billion to develop. Um, that seems a lot of money for a game, but um, it was developed by Japan Studios and mm. published by Sony Computer Entertainment for the original PlayStation in 1999 in Japan, and then it was released in 2000 in North America, and then 2001 in Europe. Um, the game was directed and designed by, and forgive me if I mispronounce this, uh, Yazuki Yez Yezuki Hashiba? Mm -hmm. who who also created the story outline. The producer was uh, Shu Shuhi Yoshida. And this game was both one of the last and largest projects he worked on prior to leaving Japan Studio. Right. Um, one of the things the game was known for is it was one of the first games to use realistic CGI cutscenes, or mm. um, I think they're called FMVs, mm. is that right? Full motion video. Yeah. Um, there was a sequel uh, in production after Yoshida left, but it was canceled for unknown reasons. Mm. Um. The story, it's kind of involved, but it's one of those where um, the hero is reborn when mm. he's needed in the world. And um, the game starts with the hero Dart. He's traveling to his home village after turning from a failed journey to avenge the death of his parents. Mm. The opening cutscene of the game shows um, at, when he's a kid, his entire village is killed by what they refer to as the Black Monster. So he has spent his life trying to hunt down this Black Monster and mm -hmm. avenge his parents, um, and he has failed thus far. When he comes home to his home village, um, it's under attack. And he goes to find his childhood friend, Shana or Shana. There's some controversy of how you pronounce her. Um, and she's been captured by a military force loyal to the evil dictator Emperor Dole. Mm. Um, as he begins his adventure to free Shana and keep her safe, he discovers that he has inherited the power of the Dragoon, a knight who fought in an ancient battle 10,000 years ago for the mm. survival of humans. Now the war is about to begin again and Dart must protect the world in Shina, who plays a mysterious part in the whole affair. On his adventure, he will encounter other Dragoons, both friends and enemies. Together, they will battle on to the final fight. Mm. Um, it's a it's considered a uh, uh, JRPG mm -hmm. um, and the battle system is really unique at least it was for me 
Um, I did not find this game until uh, 2016, 2017. It okay. was re-released. Um, um, no, uh, on the PlayStation Network on December 22nd of 2010 in Japan, mm. and then May 1st, 2012 in North America. Um, and I played it on the PlayStation 3, but it was originally on the PlayStation 1. So it's got the very blocky uh, mm. graphics, um, but the um, the banner system, um, it's not... What it is is they call them additions. And what it is is you have a prompt when when a battle ensues um, and you go to attack, you've got two squares that pop up on screen. And one square rotates until it matches the, the square on the bottom. Right. And you have to time it just right and you know hit the X button when the squares match. Um, two blue squares pop up, one on the outside and one on the inside. The outer square will rotate in, and if the player presses X at the right time, the square turns white. If the player mm. is too slow, it will turn blue, and if they are too fast, it will turn gray. You will right. still hit, but you won't do as much damage as you would if you timed it correctly. Right. And as the game goes on, you pick up um, more and more additions. Some of them only have two two time squares, but in the later games, it, it has five and six mm. different squares that you have to Sorry, get some have very difficult. precise um, timing on. Yeah. Um, so I I wasn't able to do a lot of the higher additions, but like I said, you'll still do damage. You just won't do as much damage as you would if you um, were good enough to complete the addition. Right. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, Japan Studio still owns it. Um, Sony still mm -hmm. owns it. Um. As far as who I would like to see remake it, um, I had actually forgotten this part of it. Um, but um, I know uh, Blue Point may be good. Um, they were the ones that redid Shadow of the Colossus. Okay, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, Shadow of, of the Colossus kind of had that same uh, blocky... Um, because I think, didn't that come out on the original PlayStation? Yeah, Shadow of the Colossus was an, an OG. Uh, was, Shadow, was Shadow of the Colossus PS1 or PS2? It Summer. was PS2. PS2. Oh, was it PS2? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, but yeah, still. Yeah, Point did a I, really I good think... job with um, the remaster of that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, you know, since they've done other Sony um, mm. properties, I think they would be a good choice to possibly do that um yeah so okay cool um i hope i, I didn't we... get anything <laughs> no 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 that's perfect that's perfect um so it's still owned by japan studios which yeah is is sony entertainment that's uh sony online entertainment owned uh, company um the next game to talk about is manhunt death oh snap <laughs> Okay, Manhunt series. Um, it was hilarious for Manhunt because one Christmas my parents got us video games and they got me. Um, it was one of the Need for Speed games, and I'm looking at like I don't like racing games. They, they, they got my brother Manhunt, and we're like, well, we'll just switch. So I started playing Manhunt, and um. Oddly enough, certain games, I used to play the same album in the background playing these games. And if you guys are familiar with Primus, I used to be playing Frizzle Fry in the background while I'm playing Man. <laughs> mm. But it was enjoyable. The, the first one was was really enjoyable. You had, um, it felt kind of more genuine than part two did. 
two felt like it was just kind of sterile. Right? I mean, mm. It was like good, like it, if it was just a, a sterilized version of one, it mm. didn't feel as well of an atmosphere because one, you're a convicted felon, you get executed on TV, but they faked it, and you're told, hey, if you survive the night killing people for me, I'll let you go. And it's just gruesome. Mm. And then two, it's like, I think you were a brainwashed, uh, a, you were some brainwashed gentleman that I think was out of a psychiatric war or something, just like killing people for the hell of it. And I think the conclusion was that they've been doing this to you over and over, and they can just keep erasing your memory, and you go off and kill more people for these mm. guys. And I it would be great. The to... First Manhunt, there was a lot of controversy about some of the ways you could murder people. Yes, because every weapon you had had different stages. There was a meter that went from green, yellow to red, so they all had their own unique executions, and they got either more violent or more gruesome. You were even able to pick up people's heads that you cut off with wire and hold it on your back pocket on your utility and throw it at people to either knock them like oh, wow. unconscious or mm -hmm. to make noise. And what was nice was that wow. you could use the microphone for games and you could actually speak to the microphone to make noise locations that they would come to you. And um, I think SOCOM had a microphone for theirs and I had to use mm. that mic and I'm like you'll be playing at night, trying to stay quiet and your brother in the background just yell at the mic on purpose, get you screwed over and you get killed. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great like part. Mm. Oh yeah. It was really great and uh, part two just felt like there, there was so much controversy with 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 two. Like two was when I got so much more controversy because they would not let you purchase it overseas. They had banned it outright until they censored mm. it, and then they censored it, and you played it, and it just it didn't have the same feel. Okay. But I I would love to see Rockstar because they were the ones that did it. I believe uh, redo that series. They could do a mm. whole new series with that but they just don't well i mean first they'd have to finish um gta, GTA 6 5. first <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's also on top of uh finally letting go of gt 5s online and mm -hmm. maybe actually fixing red dead 2s online for people that never get help from rockstar you mean yeah i wish they would <laughs> Yeah, you mean actually add some content to Red Dead Redemption online? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that or make it a, a private server where you can get one, kind of like Fallout 76. That way you can get your friends on there and actually play the game the way you want. Yeah. You don't worry about yeah, assholes than... coming up behind you and shooting the shit out of you. Yeah, right. Um, so it's it's owned by Rockstar, you said? Yeah. yeah. Rockstar North, I believe, still owns it. What is funny yeah. about GTA and Red Dead, I'm so sorry to go off on this tangent, um, of all the patches they made of fixing bugs, they fixed the one patch that, I mean, they fixed the one bug that everyone liked where you could get your own server, essentially. And oh, yeah. they fixed they, they, they fixed that one, but did fix everything else. Yeah. yeah, they fixed the one that people actually wanted to remain and was useful, but got rid of the one that people didn't want, yeah. So, do you, you reckon it'd be Rockstar would be the company to uh, run with it? Honestly, yes. I, I I think it would be good for them to do it, but I think they still have different studios, so maybe give it to a studio that's not focused on GTA. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, the next one is uh, Might and Magic. Now, there's a huge swathe of Might and Magic games. Um, uh, there was Might and Magic 1, Book of the Secret in the Sanctum, 19, uh, 1986. Then uh, 2, Gates of Another World in 1988. 3, Isles of Terror in 1991. 4, Clouds of Zine in 92. Uh, 5, Dark Side of Zine, 93. World of Zine in 94. 6 was Mandate of Heaven in 98. Then 7, which is the one I'm going to concentrate on, which was uh, for Blood and Honor in 99. Um, then 8 was Day of the Destroyer in 2009, Writ of Fate in 2002, and then 10 was Legacy in 2014. 
who also had multiple spin-offs, including the Heroes and Might and Magic series, which had, which are, I think they're up to six, five or six now on that one. Um, there was Crusaders of Might and Magic, there was Warriors of Might and Magic, Legends of Might and Magic, Might and Magic Heroes Kingdoms, and the fan-made uh, Swords of Zine uh, in 2003. Ubisoft acquired the rights to Might and Magic because um, 3DO went bankrupt effectively, and they brought out uh, another one called Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, which was developed by Arcane Studios, who Microsoft now own. Um, uh, it, there was also the uh, RPG Might and Magic Clash of Heroes, developed by Capybara, and the mobile strategy yeah. game Might and Magic Elemental Guardians. Now, I think the entire series is worthy of completely redoing it. Oh, my God, that's a black fluffy cat. Oh, it's a fluffy cat. Oh, you must have it. Um, well, I think all of them deserve re-looking at, and it's such a, a rich and deep lore. Um, the one I would like to, that I would most enjoy being resurrected um, would be Seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, for Blood and Honor. Um, it's a role-playing game uh, for Windows, published in 1999 by 3DO and developed by New World Computing. Um, the game follows on from the events of Might and Magic 3, um, which is the prequel to Blood and Honor, and Might and Magic 6, Mandate of Heaven. Um, you form a party of four characters. It was very traditional um, Western RPG in that element, is you, you made a character group, like you were playing Dungeons & Dragons, right? You have a character group, you pick your heroes, you build your heroes how you want your heroes, and then you go in. And the story doesn't really change based on that. Um, you had to manage your inventory, um, which was the, the shape of the item dictated where you, know, you could put things, and you were limited by what you could carry in your inventory, but each character had their own inventory. Um, it was a mix of 2D sprites and 3D models. So you had the 3D blocks of buildings, but the creatures attacking you were these high-res, for the time, um, high-res sprites that sort of um, came towards you and attacked you, and um, they had anim basic animations for walking towards you, basic animations for walking to the left or to the right, and a basic animation for walking away. So it was a very... Um, <laughs> they weren't 3D models, it was literally sprites. It was um, it was a very interesting game from, the, uh, from a graphics perspective, but then, as I say, very limited uh, for the time. Um, the game had a lot of branching storyline with it. Um, they really uh, implemented a lot from the um, previous games of the ability to choose right, um, the good, good campaign or the bad campaign. And then within that, there were choices you could make as well. Um, it was a um, very heavy fantasy set universe. You know, sort of um, orcs and goblins and there were a lot of fantasy and mythological creatures in there um it takes place in the world of enroth um across the continent of uh, antagarich um the continent is divided into several regions including the elven lands of avli and the tellurian forest the barons of deja um which house the necromancer stronghold of the pit the swamps and the snow-capped mountains of tatalia the bracada desert and the cloud cities of uh, celeste and mount nyon um, there, there were you had the dwarven lands, the Barrow Downs, where you have to go through the the um, through the underside and the overside, the overground. You know, each of the maps was quite in depth and detailed. Um, it was uh, you could choose to play it in real time combat, which was really really hard, um, considering it based the combat off the strength of your PC. So if you had a really crappy PC, real-time combat was really easy. 
but if you had a very powerful PC, real-time combat was like fighting a hurricane. <laughs> it was absolutely brutal. Just arrows flying at you at 10,000 miles and you know, like, run away! It was awesome. Um, uh, there was a rich and diverse, for the time, character and class system. So you had you know, knights and paladins and rogues and wizards and, you know, all the the, the, the uh, assassins and things. And within those classes, you had skills. And each class could take that skill to a certain level. And once you unlocked certain combinations of skills, you could take your um, knight and turn them into a death knight, you know. And that would change your character. But you could only do that if you aligned in a certain way. Um, or you could turn into a paladin and you'd be sort of a celestial paladin, you know, all complete with um, winged armor and massive shields and things. So it was there was a nice sort of combination of small improvements over the previous iterations of the games, but a lot of stuff that inspired a lot of later games. Um, uh, there were uh, there was a lot of story based player choices. Um, other ma major additions to the previous series was a game called Archimage, which Archimage was um, there was a quest to collect all the cards. It was like a mini game, in game card game, and the idea was to um, go to different taverns and fight people to try and get the cards. Um, once you got all the cards, the the you you could you had the full deck, and that was you, you effectively won Archimage. But the you, the idea of Archimage was very it was a really simple game. You had two towers, you know, and they had set health, say fifty health each, and then you had cards that would either damage the towers, give you more resources, build your wall to defend your tower, um, or build your tower. And there was a couple of set. Each tavern had their own rules for, you know, one might be the only way to win is to destroy the enemy's tower. One might be you have to produce so many resources a turn. Another one might be, you know, you get your tower up to size 150 and you win the game. And uh, whenever you got to a winning condition, you had to survive a turn on unless you destroyed the enemy tower. So it was quite a, an in-depth mini-game, really, for the time. And, I mean, there weren't many mini-games in games at that time. Most people just concentrated on making the game. Now we, we, we go into games and we thoroughly expect an RPG to have, you know, additional things like in Witcher you expect to have, you know, Gwent. When you go into a Final Fantasy game now, you expect to have... You know, card games or dice games or, or ch chocobo racing or, you know, all that kind of stuff. That wasn't really a thing until Might and Magic kind of started introducing that in in their previous games. So they, they really did kind of um, set the stage for a lot of current RPGs, specifically the Western RPGs. Um, they they had a lot of the those elements in Japanese RPGs at the time, but Western RPGs were a lot more. They they tended to try to be a lot more highbrow, and they didn't have a lot of humor in them. Um, but the 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 Might and Magic series always included several tongue in cheek references, you know, um, uh, not only to other games in that series, but also to TV and movies. And other games as well. Um, one of the, the 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 most memorable references in Might Magic Seven is you're sent on a quest to find all these golem parts, right? And you find you know the chest piece, and then you go somewhere else and you find the leg, the left leg, and you find the right leg and the right arm and the left arm, and then you find two heads. You've got a normal head and an abbey normal head, and depending which one you decided to use depended on whether you ended up having a golem that was going to be effectively your fifth party member or if you were going to have a golem that was going to try and kill you. 
<laughs> you know, so you it was a direct imp- reference to um, what was it the Young Frankenstein, where where uh, uh, Igor goes and gets the uh, the Abbey normal head. He says, "You picked up the head that I told you to get." Oh yes, 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 yes. Well, no, I picked up a different head. It was the Abbey head. Abbey head, yeah, Abbey normal. <laughs> And it was very good. It was really well done. Um, uh, it's currently owned by Ubisoft, so we can only hope that someone else buys out the rights to it, because I don't want NFTs in my fucking games. Um, uh, as a series, the lore is deep, um, if not deeper than Elder Scrolls, which is saying something, because Elder Scrolls is a deep lore game. Um, it has the potential to become a huge IP if it was given the attention and care it deserved. Um, the whole Universe and Might and Magic series is split over multiple storylines, arcs, um, much like the MCU. Like, there's huge array. Like, it goes from covering everything from, you know, just within this one world to multiple worlds, including space travel. If you can imagine space travel... Um, in a fantasy setting, it's really strange. Um, it, the, it's. I'd love to see this developed as a, as a four-player co-op game, where instead of making the party and you just control your party of four, you can control your party of four and run around as a party of four. But I'd really like to see it set so that it was four-player, so that each person took over one of the party members or more than four-player. You know, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't have eight or twelve. Um, uh, the game is uh, a foundation of a lot of Western RPGs and inspired Elder Scrolls and Dragon Age. Um, the creators of Elder Scrolls and Dragon Age have absolutely referenced Might and Magic um, as being one of their um, inspirations. It was the first real computer adaptation of a Dungeons and Dragons style universe that was successful, anyway. Um, there, there's so much that can be improved, but the general tongue and cheekness of the RPG series really would set it aside from Elder Scrolls comparisons, because a lot of people go, oh, well, why do you need a fantasy story uh, RPG when you've got Elder Scrolls or you've got Dragon Age coming up? Well, both of those are very highbrow, very, very serious, very serious, you know, I mean, Elder Scrolls is, I mean, it's got a little bit of humour in there, but it's mainly a serious rpg dragon age no humor involved it's purely deadly serious apart from one or two small characters whereas might and magic was it never took itself seriously it was the epitome of dungeons and dragons you know i mean you had whoever made the game was the dungeon master for the game and they they'd come up with stupid things and stupid rules and silly ideas and it was great um, I, I'd love to see them do the whole series, carrying on your choices across the series. I think that would be amazing if they did that. Um, I think that there's not enough games that give you the ability to change the outcome of subsequent games um, at the moment. Um, I, I just I I have a horrible feeling that it's just going to be left on the shelf to rot like an abnormal normal head though. I would love for you to be able to stream it. Oh yeah, yeah, I'd love to, but it, it it's getting it to work on yeah, current exactly. PCs is really difficult. Mm. Um, I think I'd like to see a combination of Bethesda, um, uh, Arcane Studios, uh, and maybe id Software as well. Because I'd like to see a more gruesome and brutal RPG experience. I want to see body parts flying when you hit someone with a giant hammer. I want to see, you know, when you hit someone with a fireball, I want to see people getting roasted. Like, I want to be able to fire a fireball at a chicken and roast the chicken so that when I harvest the chicken, I've got roast chicken. You know? (laughs) Like, it makes sense. I want to see stuff like that. I'd like to see um, kind of the style of combat with Doom, you know, that kind of fast, over-the-top, just gruesome, silly combat combined with the silly storylines um, and the the traps and the sort of Dark Messiah kind of silly open-world kind of 
fun RPG. Because we don't really... Most of RPGs now, they're very slow. I mean, Elder Scrolls is probably one of the faster RPGs of the Western-style RPGs. And it's really slow. Like, you know, there's no... The dragon moves really slowly. You've got plenty of time to line up a shot with the, the bow and arrow and hit the dragon as it flies by. You know, but in real life, a dragon flying past would be like a fucking fighter jet. <laughs> it would be brutal trying to hit one of those things. Um, I'd like to see uh, it redone with, you know, that level of detail to the RPG that they had. That class system where you can create your own characters and different races have their own stats and abilities and and but also with that faster kind of id software style gameplay which id software do so well you know and bring bethesda in for the storytelling and the um being able to interact with everything which is their kind of shtick um but definitely stick with the humor you we, you'd need to keep the humor because that was the selling point for might and magic was the, the humor um the next game to talk about, Muti, leading on from Might and Magic, a game that was inspired by it, is Morrowind. I don't know, I just woke my hands about. Uh, Morrowind is the third, is the third in the series of games yeah. of the Elder Scrolls series uh, made by Bethesda. It was released in 2002 for the PC and Xbox. It follows, it follows um, Daggerfall, Dagger Dagger which is Elder Scrolls 2, and prior to that, uh, Arena Elder Scrolls 1. Uh, the, uh, the story starts, starts in Vardenfell. Vardenfell, Vardenfell is, is a part of Morrowind, uh, which, is uh, which is the Dunmer, Dunmer province, uh, Dunmer, Dunmer being the Dark Elves. Morrowind, Morrowind is part of a continent called the Tamriel Continent. Uh, you start off as a prisoner on board a uh, Imperial ship. And, and while, while you're on the ship, ship you're sleeping, you're sleeping and you have a dream of a prophecy. Uh, you, are you are then woken up mid-dream by a character Jeeb. called Jeeb. Um, and, uh, and he lets you know that you've arrived at a place, a port called Sedanine. Now, um, you... Once you're speaking to the official there to register your name and uh, who you are, you're able to customize your character and your story starts from there. Um, now, the uh, main character in um, you, uh, the main story, it pits you against a god called Dagoth Ur, who wishes to free Morrowind from all imperial rule and law. Uh, now, there are many side quests. I mean, you can directly do the um, main quest uh, without having to do any side quests, but I find that side quests also help you level up. Now, uh, in this game, I when we first started playing it, um, we, we discovered, to our chagrin, that you can't join all of the guilds if you don't do it if you do it, if you don't do it in a certain way. So basically, um, if you join the fighters guild and start working for them, you then can't join the thieves guild. Um, so in order to be able to join the fighters guild, the thieves guild, you want to join them at the same time. Uh, Mages Guild, you can join them whenever you want. Uh, Morag Tong, again, you can join them whenever you want. Um, uh, yeah, and then you've got the side quests where you'll find random quests dotted here and about in the uh, environs. And to be honest, you will never be able to complete all of the uh side missions you find dotted around because there are just so many that the landscape is very open plain it's it i 
honestly, we, we have played this game for so long, and I know for a fact we haven't done all the quests that are out there. Um, it's a fantasy RPG. Um, there are many inspirations they've drawn from the West medieval era and various games such as um, Might and Magic, as Eli mentioned. Um, there are elements also from the steampunk background, which you'll see in how they designed some of the landscapes, some of the buildings, and east, uh, uh, eastern backgrounds as well. As I said, it's open plane. Uh, you can, uh, with the main quest and side quests. The game is ridiculously customizable. You can choose your gender, your race, how your character looks, their birth sign, and their class. Now, the birth sign and the class and a race will affect your stats, abilities, and attributes. So, uh, if you, for, for example, uh, pick a um, Imperial, they they have a higher speech craft, so you you'll find it easier to bribe someone. Whereas if you pick um, with the star sign of the lady, if you pick the lock as your star sign, you are able to lock pick easier. And um, dark elf is greater with magic. Uh, so you've got limitations and advantages to both the birth sign class and race. Um, it won Game of the Year and sold over 5 million copies worldwide. Eventually two DLCs were created, Tribunal and Blood Moon. Uh, this was then sold with the main game as Game of the Year edition. Uh, the... You'll find that you can read books in the actual game itself, and each book is very much um, who the the person that wrote it spent so much of his time writing each and every book. Uh, how much was it? It was about ten years, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and Bethesda loved it so much that they incorporated everything he had written. In fact, they wrote, he wrote language for the game. Uh, the game allowed the mod community to create mods that could be added into the game to create new experience for gamers, such as new missions, characters, buildings, adding futuristic things such as the Starcraft, Star Trek holodeck mod. <laughs> Morrowind is able to support third-party mods, Due to the popularity of the game and the ability to make mods, it became a game where game, gamers are still making mods to this day. Now, I thought if Bethesda promised not to alter the storyline in any way, add in any pay-to-win stuff, I would honestly like to see them remake it because they I think they'd do a good job. Yeah, I think, yeah, Bethesda. I think... Bethesda, now owned by Microsoft, are less likely to add that stuff in. Yeah. Um, they seem to be uh, moving away from that kind of thing. I think. Um, it, I think then they 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 would make a good job of it. Yeah. Okay. The next game we're going to talk about is the last game I'd like to talk about, which is Outcast. Now, Outcast was remastered recently. They released the um, second contact, I think, was the remaster. But yeah. it was uh, it's an action adventure video game developed by the Belgian developer Appeal and released by Infogrames um, for Windows in 1999. It was critically acclaimed um, and was named Adventure Game of the Year by GameSpot in 1999. Uh, in 2001, Appeal developed a sequel called Outcast 2: The Lost Paradise, which was never finished due to bankruptcy. In 2010, the game was re-released via digital distribution on uh, uh, GOG. 2014, it was remastered as Outcast 1.1 after the original developers reacquired the IP. And in 2017, a remake titled Outcast Second Contact was released on Windows, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. 
The player controls the protagonist, Cutter Slade, um, around the alien world of Adelpha. In third person or first person view, I always prefer first person view, um, and only uses two mouse buttons. Um, the right mouse button aims the player's weapon, and the other is context sensitive. Um, the player can walk, run, jump, crawl, climb onto virtually any ledge um, Cutter can reach with a jump. Aside from the tutorial area, the player is free to move to any region of Adelpha. It was really one of the first fully 3D open world games that were available. Um, you could travel as you pleased through uh, gates known as Daukas. Um, the player can teleport beacon, uh, can drop teleport beacons and from the F-Link gadget to instantly move between areas with inside, inside a region where the beacons didn't work between regions. Um, the player can also acquire a Twanha. So if you ever hear me kiss, calling someone a dumb Twanha in my streams, that's where it comes from. Um, it's a beast of burden that can be ridden, um, which makes traversing the vast regions much quicker, either by simply buying one or doing certain quests to reward the player with one. And honestly, doing the quest was so, so much easier. <laughs> um, a large part of the game focuses on uh, conversing with the friendly aliens known as the Talan in order to learn the, the story and history of Adelpha and to progress in Cutter's mission to find the probe. While this can all be skipped, um, they treat the player differently depending on how the player treats them through a reputation system. Um, much like uh, Mass Effect does. Um, that kind of, if you don't do the side quests, you're, the, the ending is not as complete and not as uh, easy to do. Whereas if you did the side quests, and how you did the side quests changed a lot to do with how the game plays. Um, if the player performs many tasks to help them, they're likely to be more eager to help. Whereas if the player does things that will harm them, they'll be much more angry with the player and aggressively dismiss them. There are multiple variations of dialogues which can be selected randomly, all based on the player's reputation. The system of multiple choice was uh, almost revolutionary at the time, and many games have copied their branching storylines since. There are multiple ways of approaching objectives, from running and gunning to stealth and general shenaniganery. Um, the enemy soldiers could be weakened by performing certain tasks for a leader in the region. When this was done, they would stop producing resources for the soldiers, stopping food production lowered their health, stopping mining made their weapons less powerful. A good reputation is necessary to convince the Talan to stop production of resources, so the player is encouraged to be good to the Talan. However, you could absolutely play the game not being good if you so chose. Um, the, it used a, a unique way to save the game and integrated with the game world. At the start of the game, the player receives an object called a GAMSAV. Yes, right on the nose, game save. It was a crystal that you held and squeezed and it grew bright. Yes, Wenchi, you had to squeeze this rather long phallic symbol and make it glow <laughs> in order to save your game and capture your essence. Um, uh, you equip the game save, squeeze it like a cucumber, making it glow and emit sound. Um, the sound can be heard by enemies and they will investigate, so the player must take the situation into account before saving a game. Uh -oh. After a few seconds, the game pauses <laughs> and the menu overlay appears. Uh, it's currently owned by THQ Nordic. Um, uh, announced as the official sequel, uh, titled Outcast 2, A New Beginning, is being developed and should be released for Windows, PS5, and Xbox Series X and S. Um, while the new game is certainly welcome, and the game did receive a remaster, if you play it, it's awful. Um, the gameplay just has not aged well. Um, it feels like a 1999 game. <laughs> It just looks like a 2008 game. <laughs> you know, it's sort of they did a really good job in updating it to 2008 graphics in 2017, um, but they did not do a good job with the um, the gameplay at all. It's just it's so clunky. Um, I, I feel it needs to be reimagined from scratch on a new game engine like Unreal. Um, five. Um, it predated GTA 3 for open world exploration by two years and was a far more enjoyable experience in my eyes. 
and featured many of the uh, things that most games today take for granted. So, I mean, it really was the granddaddy for Far Cry. It was the granddaddy for the GTA series. It was the granddaddy for a lot of those kind of go-do-what-you-want kind of games. Um, if I were to pick a company to do I, uh, do the, ju the IP justice, I think if people from Ninja Theory, um, the guys behind Senua's Sacrifice, Bioware, and possibly Digital Extremes got together, um, either one of those three companies would do a good job, but I'd love to see them all come together to work on it. Um, uh, Bioware with their deep RPG background, Ninja Theory, just for the sheer attention to detail and graphical prowess, prowess and Digital Extremes, just because Digital Extremes are always consistently, they have the fans at the um, center of attention with any game they make. Um, I think it it's a great game. Um, it had, graphically, I mean, for the time, it was amazing. The water um, reflections were incredible for the time. Like, there was, I'm not going to say ray tracing, but it was pretty damn good uh, rasterization um, and they used a lot of techniques that have uh, uh, evolved to give you ray tracing um, but were uh, at the time revolutionary I mean we did we just didn't have um, that kind of reflection quality in games uh, back then so I, I I remember looking at it going, oh my god, the water looks so realistic. And now you go back and look at it and go, oh my god, how did I think the water looked so realistic? <laughs> you know. Um, but it was a, a great game. Uh, now we're going to move on to another one. That uh, Nitty is your final selection, Phantom Crouch. Yeah. yeah. Uh... It was produced by Genki and published by uh, Fantagram for the Xbox, uh, released in 2002. It's a mech style game that's based on speed and stealth, uh, similar to Chrome Hounds and Mech Assault. The main premise of the game are races called Rumbling. It's a, uh, a robotic deathmatch and the surviving mech wins and it takes place in old Tokyo. Yeah, but like a battle royale. Um, the mechs in question are called SV, or commonly referred to as a Scooby. Uh, every Scooby ha must have a chip. Uh, chip is like an is an AI that uh, deals with the um, targeting of enemies and defense during the races. When you start off as a new racer, you'll get a very basic chip, and the more you pay, the more you'll be able to get to more specialized ones and you get the specialized ones during uh, at the stores um, due, bet uh, between races uh, there's a store called wild machines that lets you buy the chips now when i say the stores i mean it's actually in game you don't you didn't have to use real money to get these things um, but yeah the chips are animal types and they've got different abilities and are sentient uh, the, pre uh, the story itself, as I said, takes place in Old Tokyo during the year 2031. Old Tokyo was abandoned due to severe air pollution and, and economic failure. You, you're a new race to the rumbling matches, and in order to win, you have to beat every ranked winner in every arena to get to number one. Every character you meet has their own subplot. You can converse with them in the text during the game, and you'll see the text uh, in the top. I don't know if it was left or right now. Um, and they use not only words to express what's going on, but they use emojis as well. Every rank arena match comes with new story additions about the main character plot lines. This will then eventually lead to the number one ranker and their story. The game itself is strong in customization, and when I say strong, imagine the strong the word being lit up by lights. 
You can make the Scooby look however you want with the amount of paint jobs available. You can decorate the inside of the Scooby. The one thing I like, other than all the customizations, is that there is a huge music library to choose from. Uh, music made by uh, real artists and music specifically composed for, for the game. You can buy the music in-game from the music store and it will play a selection of music you've bought while you're racing. Now, it was through this that we discovered a few bands that we liked. Um, Electric Eel Shock, uh, Star Creators, um, huh? Full Scratch, yeah. Um, when you do play the game, one piece of advice I, I have to give you is when it gets to the end credits, stay watching the end credits because the story still continues on. Um, now, unfortunately, the game didn't do great in the sales because it was released at the same time as, same week actually, as Mech Assault. But it did become a cult game very quickly. It garnered interest from Konami, who eventually created a sequel that was made for PS2, but it didn't hold the same uh, love as the first game did. The game is made backwards compatible, but due to the glitches and other issues, it's better played on the original Xbox and you use a CRT TV. Um, I believe the games company that would do the game justice in remaking it would be Microsoft. Yeah, it was uh, one thing you failed to mention there was that the um, game also had uh, the character animations when you were talking to people outside of the game uh, outside yeah. of the actual arena um it was a very anime style yeah yeah that was it anime mm. style and it was um as i said between the the matches you would have a they would be conversing while you were buying stuff for your mech upgrading it and various other things yeah, had a very deep upgrade system um, in terms of you could go for pure weight or for lightness or along all the multiple things. It was a very in-depth game. But the next game that we're going to talk about, slightly different, it's called Spec Ops The Line. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry. Man. Yeah, uh, Spec Ops came out in, what did I say, 2012. And Jaeger Development from Germany and 2K Games were it. 2K Games were in on it. But the reason I came to mind is it always pops up when I'm thinking of a good game to to think about. Like, yeah, I'd like to revisit it. That game always pops up because in my game experience, it was one of the very few games that had you allowed or make you make decisions while you played it. You know, would you do this to these people? Would you do that? Kind of decide what you wanted to do and <clears throat> how you went about the game. And during this game, you kept seeing you know, flashes of shit going on. You're like, oh, you know, what, what's going on? You know, you didn't know. <clears throat> Until you got to the very end. And it turns out the character you're playing is full-blown PTSD or whatever. He's hallucinating. And everything that you just did that you thought was helping... The mission pretty much was you're just murdering people. And the whole time you're with this platoon of guys that I believe in the beginning of the game that you know, you're know you with are actually there. But by the time you get to the end game, you realize as a player and as the character realizes that you've already killed them a while back. And this whole time, probably three quarters of the game or so, you're, you're hallucinating your team being you, being with you. You know, you're com communicating over the comms and all this stuff during the game. And this whole time, you're thinking you're after this bad guy who's taken over Dubai during this catastrophic sandstorm that destroyed half the city. And turns out it was all you <laughs> the entire time. And at the end of it, I was just awestruck. Damn pillow. <clears throat> I was just, you know, surprised. Like, oh, my God, I've never seen a game do that. You know, the psychological, psycho, psycho, yeah, that word that you go through while you're playing it. Mm. 
and you get there and you're like, what the fuck did I just do? You know, and it mm-hmm. takes you back to all these decisions you made. You know, are you going to bomb these insurgents with uh, napalm or whatever they were using in a game? And <clears throat> you flash back to actual what it was actually was, was just, you know, people just trying to escape, trying to get out. But in mm-hmm. your destroyed mind or whatever, you're seeing them as the actual enemy that you're trying to get rid of. So you call down this napalm bullshit or you send it out there yourself or something then you flash back it's just women and children trying to flee the city and as a player you're like oh my god i just i can't i was like can i not go back and redo this shit you know it's before Mm -hmm. the save i think it's ps2 it was maybe three but you know in my my mind it was one of the best games she too but my wife sent me text how much she misses me Mm -hmm. but <clears throat> it's just one of those games that just made you think as you played it, and then you made these decisions, and at the end of the game, it's like, fuck you. That's what you get. Mm. You psycho. But the game came out in 2012. I don't think, according to my notes, Jaeger was a small company that was kind of with Midway. Midway went bankrupt or something like that, and mm-hmm. they kind of got absorbed by someone else, and they didn't yeah, start laying okay, those people off. Yeah, it's okay to go over midway, yeah. And then um, after that, they just kind of laid everybody off. So Jaeger kind of went debunked, I guess. Um, Yeah, it was, according to Google and other uh, ratings, it's really high rated, 97%, 90%, one of the best games at the time. Mm. Uh, Like I said, it's 10th in a series. I haven't played any of the other ones, so I, I had no clue that it was that many games prior to that Mm. but basically i'm just talking about all that Mm. but if you ever have a chance to play it get a ps3 or whatever it was on Mm. it was on uh, xbox and pc as well i believe yeah yeah and i'm looking at it uh xbox 360 ps3 windows so yeah Mm. maybe a pretty cool thing to get Mm. Who, who, do you, worth who do you reckon you'd like to see redo it? Uh, redo it? I don't know, I guess the... I don't know, I'm not very big on who makes what, mm. but... Well, think of a... Think of a line, so. Yeah, think of a, a games company that does something similar that you think that did a good job as well for something similar to it, like uh, Gears of War or um, Epic. Uh, they did Fortnite and Unreal Tournament. Um, you've got Call of Duty. You've got the Activision guys. You know, you've yeah, got I mean, Dice. I think I was playing those games back then anyway, because like I said, I played when it came out. Mm. And I was also into, not Call of Duty, what was the other one? Medal of Honor? Medal of Honor, I was Honor, playing yeah. those. Because I like yeah, the storylines yeah. of those. But, um, you know, Activision or somebody like that can get a hold of it. Keep the storyline the way it is. You know, let's upgrade the graphics. Because the storyline was, like I said, once you got into it, you were like, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, it hits you. And you're like, oh, man, I just, I just fucked everybody up. And everybody's mm-hmm. coming at you. All the people that were coming at you because you were just committing all these, you know, whatever's the people, you know, mm-hmm. atrocities. Atrocities, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, it's a tough subject to broach. Um, I know a game previous to that that did a very bad job of that. Oh, oh I think I know um, what you're talking about. Yeah, No, I'm 69. That was a terrible, terrible game. Um, we, we actually traded it in within an, uh, an hour of playing it, wasn't it? Mm. I don't think it even lasted an hour. It on didn't it. last long. It, no. they, they didn't broach the that subject very well at all. Um, going on to a slightly different game. Um, Def, I believe you said Stubbs the Zombie. <laughs> Slightly different. Slightly different. <laughs> um, so Stubbs was something because I originally was a Nintendo 64 guy. I didn't like PlayStation because the loading time cartridges were just faster at that time. And then PS2 came out and I got into PlayStation. And that was all PlayStation. And then Xbox came out and I was like, okay, they're I seen games they had, but the one that caught my eye was Stubbs the Zombie. I seen the trailer for it. I'm like, oh my god, 
that's the only reason I would ever get to have bigger Xbox. And I missed out on the first generation of Xbox. I, I did not get in until the 360, primarily because the white and black buttons for the original Xbox, because I was so used to the PS2 layout, kind of like made me nauseous to get used to them. But when I played it, I got people I knew on that game. I got my little cousins on that game. I probably bought it four or five times over for Xbox for 360. Um, I even got my niece currently with the Series X playing it because it's compatible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just a great game. I mean, you get to play as a zombie eating people, and the zombies that you make help create more zombies that expand. And it was good. There was the whole style of it. The music was great. And um, I wouldn't like to see a remaster of the game. I would like to see the sequel actually made. And apparently, because why did they made the game? Um, they shut down in like 2014. So there was a sequel plan, but it was canceled because they shut down. I'm not sure who owns it now, but I would assume that Hopefully, like maybe Microsoft would take it over to either resurrect what the sequel was going to be, or do something new but still in the same contrast, or maybe even modernize it so like, you have the 1960s, 30s looking stubs, and you maybe have like his son in a more current era where like the corporations have taken over and people are just so brainless that zombies are not getting nutrition off of them. So you end up having to go after the corporations to free people so you can actually have a proper brain to eat, you know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but uh, hmm. yeah, I would really love to see Microsoft do it because I mean, they have the resources and they could even make it so maybe big open world and you could have people join with you and take over different sections of the world then it'd be nice mm. i think aspire are the people that own it currently is the publisher um developers wide load um and It's funny because I read the name, but I'm not familiar at all with Aspire. Yeah, uh, they're now uh, Aspire's now with the Saber Interactive, which oh. I think Saber Interactive, um, they're kind of. Uh, they did World War Z and Crisis yeah, Remastered. Yeah, they they're, they tend to pick up a lot of IPs that are. Um, no longer being used by other companies. They just companies. hold on to them? Yeah, they get them, maybe remaster them, maybe re-release them, that kind of stuff. So, um, They have a lot they of have studios. They have a lot of studios um, and a, a lot of... Um, they, they did, did World War Z. Yeah. yeah, and they, they own Sierra Entertainment. Um they were the guys that remastered. They, they did. Um, They're even uh, doing the the Evil Dead game that's coming out. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. that's where yeah. I know that name. Okay, yeah. I, wow. I, I had heard mm -hmm. them recently, but I couldn't think where. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're one of those publishers that's just kind of people have played a lot of their games, but people don't know they've played a lot of their games. You know, um, they did Vampire for instance. Um, uh, they've done a lot of the remasters for other companies, like they were involved in the work on um, the Halo Master Chief collection. Um, they were involved in uh, Your Snow Runner, Snow Runner kind of um, Evil Dead the Game, Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Complete Edition that's coming out later this year, oh, which will be the remastered version. <gasps> On PS5 and uh, Series Bobby. X, yeah, Kingdom yeah. Come Deliverance, Painkiller. There's going to be doing another. There's going to be doing another Painkiller uh, title at some point. So yeah, they've got a, a lot of interesting things with under their belt. As I say, they're one of those companies that's done a lot, but people don't really go, "Oh yeah, Saber Interactive. I know who they are." <laughs> <laughs> um, but the next game we're going to talk about. 
is the suffering, Mr. Corman. Oh, yeah. The suffering. Man, that game was fucking badass when it came out. Oh, my God. I mean, you talk about graphics, you're like, oh, my goodness. Oh, so good. And now you go back and play it, and I'm like, ugh. Like, I still got it. I think I still have a copy of it on my PS2. I need to dig it out and play it again. Um, there's this, I can't remember the girl <clears throat> uh, that was streaming it or making videos on it. And I was just kind of watching it through her as she was playing it because she got it on the PC and she'd never played it. So I'm trying to find my notes. I'm dumbass for having it pulled up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's not the suffering. There it is. But <clears throat> anyway, I was kind of watching her play it. Got to get back into it. So, man, I want to play it. And I think I got it on the PlayStation Plus or the little PSP game hell thing. I was playing it on it and it was just chunky. So I did play it. Uh, but mm -hmm. basically, the game itself came out in uh, 2004. PlayStation 2, Xbox, then it came out in same year, Microsoft, a couple of days later or something like that mm -hmm. for a PC. But you go to prison, and you're on death row because you supposedly murdered your wife and kids, or ex-wife and kids, and you don't remember it as a character. You know, they say, yeah, you killed your wife and your kids. And he's like, oh, no, I didn't. I'm innocent. No, I didn't. The whole time in the game. And um, you get to this prison that's on an island, and some kind of earthquake, earthquake happens, and all hell breaks loose. Some kind of weird shit comes up out of the ground. Monsters with blades for hands and feet. And they're crawling on the, on the ceilings. Um, but, the, again, the psychological aspect of that game, you know, it's kind of like hulking out. But during the whole time you're playing a game, you're like, is this dude really transforming? Or is this, you know, all in his head? Mm. And because once you get so angry, you're like, you turn into a dude with blades for hands or arms for hands or <laughs> blades for arms. And uh, you just start slashing, slashing the dots and then going through these people and killing them. And it's also one of the, to me, one of the first games that gave you that choice. You know, would you save this guard or will you kill him, help him out or just kill him, get rid of him? You know, at the police, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what you hear whispering in your right ear if you're playing it with headphones. It's like, you know, F the pole, please, you know, fuck that guard. They'll, they'll screw you, blah, 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 fuck them. Or your ex wife is like, no, no, he's an innocent. He needs to be helped, you know, help him out. You know, whichever one you decided to go with, uh, alter the ending of the game. I think it said it had three different endings you can go through. And um, I think I went with the, I usually go the, the helper way, the hero. <clears throat> and, um, I went through it that way. Every now and then I'd kill a bad guy or one of the other prisoners that were like, man, if this guy, and I shoot him, I see him kill a guard, I go up and kill them instead of help him. You know, my ex-wife is like, oh, help him out. I'm like, no, he just killed this guy. You know, come on, get your priorities straight. So kind of midlined it. But during the whole game, you're just trying to fight and get through it at different levels to finally escape the island <clears throat> or you get to the ferry to escape the island. Mm. And the whole time, the ghost of this psychiatrist, psychiatric doctor, whatever the hell he was, who was on that island previous before the prison was put there, um, had an asylum. He ran it, and he also did experiments on these insane people, and that's where all these monsters and demons are coming from. They're his creations that mm. are spawning back from all his bullshit that he tried on these crazy people. You know, all that bad juju energy just soaked up into that island, and an earthquake just you know, shook it all up, made them all come back. And uh, this whole time, he's following you, <clears throat> you know, through different aspects of the game. And he's talking to you. He's like, I don't want to get inside your head and look at you, you know, dissect you, dissect you and figure out what you are, what you're made of. And the whole time, you're trying to follow these hordes of zombies, not zombies, but monsters. <clears throat> and um, I can't remember the exact ending of the game, but you finally get to the outside. I think you fight him in some kind of room or somebody, and you finally get through him and win, and you leave, then it picks up the suffering, too. Um, home ties it bind. Not home cousin, mm -hmm. Spider-Man. So anyway, you escape the island, you get on the ferry, you get it to the mainland, and you go back to your place where you used to live, where you supposedly killed your family. And you're still, you know, don't know what the hell happened. You keep getting these flashbacks 
and you could kind of control yourself in these flashbacks like what did i do and you keep trying to go save your wife and your ex-wife and kids in these flashbacks but then you always end up seeing them on the ground dead or thrown out the window killed or whatever and um you get back to your apartment or whatever and you know pretty much the same things there all these monsters followed you there the doctors doctors still trying to get you so i don't remember that aspect of it very much um like I said, I watched that girl play it, so it's kind of more fresher in a memory on the suffering one. But in the two, <clears throat> he goes back home. They follow him over there, and the first one was not very well recepted because of the violence and mm -hmm. you know the gore and stuff like that, and the aspect of some of the monsters <clears throat> were. I, don't know, I wouldn't say it was too sexualized, but yeah, I've seen worse than Silent Hill games. Uh, Homecoming, that game was way out there with its, you know, the way they designed their monsters or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, Suffering 2, where'd it go? If they even have it. Can I mention one thing very quick, too? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The Suffering 2 was also part of the line of games that came out where the, where the protagonist suddenly spoke. Because in part one, there was no speaking. In part two, all, all of us had that, that, that shock moment. Because I don't remember if it, if it was a flashback to him in prison and he speaks at the table. And we're like, oh crap, he talks. He talks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Suffering 1, the dude never says a word. And it's like, you don't talk much, do you? He's just like, like, come on, mm. dude, say something. That's before they had the. <clears throat> at least that game didn't have the options where you can choose what they say. Mm. But uh, software, surreal software came out with it with mid games. Uh, PlayStation Two, Xbox, Microsoft was ties it bind. Came out in '05. Yeah, but mm. it wasn't real well receptive everybody kind of said you know it's the same game just in a different setting which you know it's kind of way well I mean that's what a sequel <laughs> is isn't it yeah, I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean to me it's it's silly when they say things like that because if it's a sequel you kind of want it to be you know the same game in a different setting <laughs> you know maybe add a few small things to it but generally if you're after a sequel you don't want it to be this completely different game because that's it's, it's not a he's sequel. Suffering, then. but he's all happy now. He's not really yeah. suffering. Yeah. <laughs> he found peace. Yeah. But I don't really remember a whole lot of the suffering, too. I just remember you get there and you fight a bunch of monsters and you get inside the apartment. It kind of fades from there. But, mm. you know, sorry, somebody bringing it back. I think Rockstar would probably be best on that because they do a lot of that, that kind of stuff. A whole lot mm. of storyline with it and choosing between different. Um, uh, or whatever I'm trying to say. But, you know, your choices matter, basically. Mm -hmm. There's another game that did that, too, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Mm. Yeah, it came out around the same time as... Uh, there was a couple of other games that came out at the same time that were very kind of similar. Um, there was that one... Uh, there was PsyOps. Uh, and then there was another one where you played a detective. And you kind of... Uh, you're trying to solve a crime, but there's all these monsters turn up and just start. It goes from being this very simple kind of, you know, um, detective type game where you've got to solve a crime to, oh shit, there's just fucking monsters coming in off the ceilings and stuff. And it was about three or four of the games that came out about the same time as The Suffering that I remember because I, I remember looking at buying one of them at the time. And there was these four games, and it was like, well, shit, which one do we pick? You know, which one are we going to go with? And I think in the end we went with the detective one. Um, but yeah, the suffering, they, they all, all three of them got, or all four of them got into trouble over the gore and the violence that was in them. They yeah. were considered uber-violent video games uh, at the time. And it was ridiculous, because they really weren't. I mean, compare that to... Um, evil within now you know i mean that, that, that they were all they were quite tame compared to evil within i mean in evil yeah. within you know you see a guy 
hacking into your arm with a, a, a rotary blade, you know, and uh, running nails through your arms and things like that. And you've got that that other one that was based in the um, the mental asylum where um, you've just got a camera and every, you're just walking around the mental asylum filming as you walk through trying to outcast. escape. Yeah, outcast. Yeah, that was that's. I've got playing hand. I'm like, oh, damn it. Yeah, trying that's to run a the locker. brutal. Brutal game this visually. This one I can't watch. Yeah, it, it's it's brutal. I mean, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think you're right. With Rockstar would probably, I don't think it needs to go as far as Outcast and Outcast Two in terms of violence. Um, I think the storyline. It's, it's already got enough violence yeah. with the storyline as it is. Yeah. So yeah, I think Rockstar would be the ones to go. Maybe kind of. Um, branching storyline, kind of like Bully, but with the a bit more gore to it than yeah. Rockstar's usual. So yeah, yeah, I think that'd be a good one. Okay, and the final game we're going to talk about tonight um, is courtesy of Miss Wenchy. It's called Too Human. Okay, it is a wonder this game ever got me. Um, it's been a long history. Uh, the premise of the game is it is a sci-fi action RPG about Norse gods who take on the form of cybernetically enhanced humans battling against the robotic swarms of Loki. And if I remember correctly, you play as Balder. Mm -hmm. Um... Originally, it was slated for release in 1999 on the original PlayStation, but then Silicon Knights partnered with Nintendo, and it moved to a GameCube release in 2000. However, development suffered because devs were splitting their time on two other games, Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem, and Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes. Mm -hmm. Then, five years later, in 2005, the game re-emerged as a Xbox 360 release because of a new partnership with Microsoft, and the game was slated to become a trilogy. Mm -hmm. The game missed a holiday 2006 release, and the budget was blooming into between 60 and $100 million at that point. Um, and then the trouble began. Uh, Silicon Knights and Epic Games signed a licensing deal where all future titles from the studio would be made in the Unreal 3 engine. On July 19th of 2007, Silicon Knights sued Epic Games for a breach of contract, citing that the Unreal Engine wasn't complete and that Epic Games was using licensing fees to fund its own game, Gears of War, instead of finishing the Unreal Game Engine. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Epic Games counter sued stating Silicon Knights knew when it committed to the licensing agreement that Unreal Engine 3 may not meet its requirements and may not be modified to meet them. Epic also made allegations that Silicon Knights were using Unreal code in their own engine to create a game for Sega. Mm -hmm. The countersuit claimed that Silicon Knights quote-unquote infringed and otherwise violated Epic's intellectual property rights, including Epic's copyright works, trade secrets, know-how, and confidential information. This began the end for Silicon Knights. In, 20, in 2012, Epic won both court battles. 
original yeah, suit and then the counter <laughs> suit. Um, Judge James C. Dever III found that Silicon Knights had deliberately and repeatedly copied thousands of lines of Epic Games' copyrighted code and then attempted to conceal its wrongdoing by removing Epic Games' copyright notices and by disguising Epic Games' copyrighted code as Silicon Knights' own code. Um, and how they proved this was when they copied, when Silicon Knights copied the code, they inadvertently copied reference notes from Epic Game Coders mm. along with the game code. Um, the judge ordered that all copies of Two Human and the more recent Silicon Knight game X-Men Destiny be destroyed. Digital copies were to be taken down from online stores as well. Three unreleased and unannounced Silicon Knights games still in development were given the same order. The Sandman, the Box Ritualist, and Siren in the Maelstrom never saw the light of day. Silicon Knights was ordered to pay $4.45 million, which almost oh, doubled, damn. which almost doubled after legal fees and other expenses were added in. On May 16, 2014, Silicon Knights filed for bankruptcy. The founder went on to start Precursor Games when he where he tried to kickstart a game called Shadow of the Eternals, not once, but twice, and it failed both times. Um, right now, Two Human was one of the last, in one of the last batch, batches of backward compatible games on Xbox, and you can still download it. It's still available. Free. Free, yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, regarding the court case, mm -hmm. uh, I followed that court case quite closely, and it was utter bullshit on Epic's part. Um, Silicon Knights produced evidence after evidence after evidence that they'd gone to to Epic and said, look, your game engine isn't working. It's not fit for purpose. Um, we've edited it so that it works. This is what we've done. Epic would take that code, apply it to the Unreal 3 engine, and then send it back to them. Uh, and then repeatedly say, well, you know, um, you've tried to copy our engine code, despite the fact that it was Silicon Knights. We're basically fixing Unreal 3 at the time. Um, and yeah, they should have just walked away from Unreal, but they'd already invested so much money into it that it was they weren't in a position where they could have done. Um, yeah. The reason that I can't game... remember the guy's name. Something Dyak? Was that the, yeah. the founder? Yeah. Um, the graphics in on in Two Human, because the art department had had so much time uh, to work on the game, the graphics in that game even now are it's impressive. gorgeous. It's, it, it's gorgeous. Um, uh, yeah, the the biggest complaint on that game is the control scheme, which if If they could fix the control scheme, it would easily be one of the best games I've ever played. Absolutely. Um, it You can get used to the control scheme and you can make uh, a good try out of a bad control scheme. Um, but the, the wasn't, there, wasn't there a little bit of platforming, climbing? There was some, yeah, there was some weird kind of, the way you moved about was weird and kind of off. And 
you attacked using the one thumbstick and you'd slide around the the, the, the arena uh, sort of skating about hitting things oh um, that's right and but it was you couldn't control the camera because the, con- the the control for the camera was just you were stuck in a certain sort of orientation and uh, it was very awkward very difficult to do um the control scheme was terrible um it was a crazily deep game in terms of the different options for armor and weapons yeah, yeah. and set pieces and runes and the lore was immense yeah um, it was one of the first 360 games i ever played mm. it was a great game i've still got it i still enjoy yeah. it still and we've still got yeah. the book as yeah, well we've still got the book as well and oh, it, wow. it pisses me off to no end the way it was treated by mm-hmm. uh, epic considering they were working on they, they literally they took Silicon Knight's money and put it towards developing Gears of War. Yeah, yeah. And and then right afterwards screwed over people can fly with Boardstorm. Yeah. Uh they they screwed a lot of companies over um to get Gears of War out. Um and then from the money they made from Gears of War they went into Fortnite. And Fortnite is one of the biggest scams of gaming, in my opinion. I, it's I made hate... so much money. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> it 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 is a game that is specifically designed to take money off children. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it, um, it I don't, I don't like play it, but um, a friend of mine was telling me that um, for Christmas, um, a family member of his, her parents got her big her big christmas present was the end game currency for fortnite because Mm. it's a game that she loves to play but that was her big christmas present Mm. and i just i don't understand it it's crazy but um you tell me how you feel about this eli but i was thinking the aesthetic of it um what would you think if Digital Extremes got a hold of it? Oh yeah, the, the going through the aesthetic, yeah. going for the visual design, the kind of, I mean, they could take a lot of existing assets from Warframe and apply it in there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, Digital Extremes would make a good job of it. I believe Microsoft now own the rights to it because it was in the. Um, suite of things they that when the coalition split from Epic, um, a lot of the stuff that Epic didn't want they threw at um, Microsoft owns it. Yeah, Microsoft owns it. Um, uh, threw it at um, uh, the coalition, and of course the coalition was owned by Microsoft. Um, so yeah, Microsoft do own it, but no one's really talked about trying to resurrect it or bring the other two games in because that game. Yeah, I would ends... have loved to have known what they had planned yeah. for the trilogy because exactly. I remember being really upset when I found out that it wasn't going to continue. Yeah, yeah. oh I, yeah, the... I was so invested in the story at that time. Yeah, it was such a heavy kind of cliffhanger. You're and left. I, in this... I love I love Norse mythology. It's one of my favorite, you know, mm-hmm. mythos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, too human. And as I say, graphically, I I wish they'd given you the ability to take control of the camera and look around, mm-hmm. because graphically that game was. I mean, it was stunning. There were elements to that game that you could go in and look around, that, that, that you just wanted to explore and do, look at it. Do you remember, I forget what they call it in, in that particular game, but the, the Tree of Life. Mm-hmm. Do you, rem- you, do you so. remember how that looked? Yeah, yeah, the, the pulsing light traveling across the branches of Yggdrasil. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was. And when you meet the Norns. And when you meet the Norns, and I mean. Oh God! Even the uh, opening sequence, the opening cutscene, mm-hmm. where uh, you're travel, you're basically going to the the tavern. Oh yeah, yeah. The the cutscenes, the everything about that game mm. looked amazing. It was a a very pretty game. Mm-hmm. Um, now that Speaking was the. Speaking of pretty kitty. Yeah, there is a very pretty kitty. Yep, that's it. Kitty's won the show. I think that's it. We've voted. Uh, we've all voted. The kitty is the one that's going to get um, uh, remade. And yeah, uh, kitty is the only one that matters now. Yeah. Um, all the other games, we can delete those. So today was a complete waste of time. Never mind. Uh, we shall just <laughs> kitty settle. Kitty will be on. remade without triggering allergies. Yeah, kitty right. will be remade without t- triggering yes, allergies. Yes, I can have all the cats ever. Mm-hmm. Mm. Sorry, random arm. Yep, random arms. Hello, yes. arm. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, going back over the list of games, uh, and and I'm sure assigning I a justice. score out of ten. Right. All right. I'm just closing those down. So we have got the first game we discussed was Black and White. Yeah. Now. In my mind, black and white, yes, it was one I chose, but I would only give it a seven um, for what it was, despite it being as good as it was. Uh, But I would give it a potential ten for what it could become. You know, if it was given the care and attention. I think all of the games that we've said today, honestly, um, could be a ten out of ten. With the the, the potential um, that's there, um, uh, Legacy of Cain has a huge amount of lore. Deus Ex is again incredibly deep storyline. Um, Enchanted Arms, I mean the uh, opening you that world that on up. Stream, didn't you, Leela? Yeah, I played some of that on stream. We Whereas haven't we finished haven't it yet. finished it yet. Um, uh, Legend of Dragoon. Uh, I'm not so aware of Legend of Dragoon because I never had a console until the original Xbox came out. Um, so I missed a lot of the Shadow of Colossus. Um, yeah, I did as well. Kind of games. Um, Manhunt. The one thing I wanted yeah. to mention about Legend of Dragoon because you were talking earlier about um, comedy. Or, mm. or, you know, uh, humor. There is a character in that that one of her attacks comes out of her vagina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So this is a, cha- a, a family channel. and uh... <laughs> I can't remember what it's called, yeah. but she literally opens up her legs and a dark ball of energy comes out from her hoo-ha. From the dark hoo-ha. hole. Hoo-ha, yeah, from a very dark hole. A hoo-ha attack. A hoo-ha attack. It, was this Big Mama? Are you sure this wasn't Seven Days? And was it called, right. a, it was called yeah. the hoo-ha attack? Yeah, the hoo-ha attack, yeah. Or so what Silent Hill had the, the, the lady or whatever giving birth? Mm. The babies at you or some shit? Sp- oh, spider? and the... Yeah, the the baby monsters coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, I think of all the games, that there's not none of the games there that we've mentioned today don't have the potential to be stunning and masterpieces. Um, I think we're in a unique position now where there's so many good companies that can work together. Um, be it with you know sort of. Like that, there, there's no reason because Sony and Microsoft work so closely together. Like this, this whole idea of the the console war is utter bullshit. It doesn't exist. Yeah, Microsoft yeah. and Sony are literally in each other's back pocket. Anything that is online based, Microsoft are making money from because Sony Online is run by Microsoft. It's a, it's an right. Azure system. Um, there's so much proprietary technology in the Xbox Series X that's owned by Sony, from the Blu-ray drive um, to the memory interface. 
Uh, similarly on the PlayStation 5, there's so much on there um, that is owned by Microsoft. The, this whole idea of um, console war is utterly ridiculous. Yeah. If you'd gone, if this yeah. was, if we were having this discussion back into in 1992 and 1993, yeah. and what games would we like to see come out on the Nintendo or the Sega? Yeah, you would get no. There, Nintendo and Sega were completely at odds. Yeah. You know, there yeah. was no shared yeah. technology between the two. Well, but we're in... it's it's sad when you think about game preservation because you know um, Sony has shut down um, a lot of the storefront, so is Nintendo. Mm -hmm. um, but the only way you can get certain games now is if you can find and afford the physical copy. Mm -hmm. Which Shadow of the Colossus, you get the PS2 version, collector's edition of Shadow of the Colossus on disc, you know, you're talking 200 bucks. It's, it's like um, if you try and get the Game of the Year version of Morrowind on it's, console. Yeah. The OG Xbox version of the Game of the Year edition of Morrowind on console. Um, uh, do you want me to actually have a look? Uh, the last time I looked... It was sixty-eight pounds. Okay, so I'm going up um, to Amazon now. So, Morrowind, uh, uh, game of the year. Yeah, game of the year. Go to uh, Xbox. Xbox. Um, it's actually on your wish list. So if you just go to your wish list, so go to account and lists over one. Yep. Not that one. No. I have a huge oh. game guide from Oblivion. I, I have so never finished that game. Okay. Never mind, it got removed. Um, but yeah, it, yeah. last time I remember it was like £68, and that was for a used copy. Wow. You know? um, it's just so expensive to get a lot of um the older games godzilla the, yeah the the old godzilla games are so expensive you want the uh you know it, it's so ridiculous how much they cost and uh you can't even buy it on amazon now there's just none available to buy from morrowind but yeah i, I think there's so many so like we're in such a unique position now where I can see, I mean, you've got, what was it, MLB The Show, which was supposed to be a PlayStation exclusive, mm. is on Xbox. You know, there's Microsoft have specifically said that while games they're going to release are exclusive to Game Pass, they say systems that support Game Pass. They're very specific that their first party studio games will be exclusive to any platform that supports Game Pass. That blows right. the door open to well, why can't Sony have Game Pass? Right. You know, why couldn't Microsoft put Game Pass on the, the PlayStation? And we're in a very unique position now where the potential for um like I'd love to see Naughty Dog do work with Bethesda and playground games you know um like that would be an amazing universe crafted oh, from shit. the 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 single player story side of naughty dog to the kind of multiplayer open world kind of aspect that you get from playground games to you know the attention to detail from bethesda you know would be an amazing game um it crash every five minutes it would just crash every five minutes because <laughs> neither of those companies, make, apart from Playground, make a game that doesn't crash every five minutes. Um, but, uh, like, I'd, I'd love to see a lot of not just the games we've mentioned tonight, but there's a lot of old games that I'd like to see resurrected. And we're in a unique position now where you can pick and say, hey, you know what? Maybe Naughty Dog does end up working with you know, digital extremes who are owned by Tencent. Maybe um, Tencent, maybe digital extremes and Naughty Dog could work with Arcane Studios 
you know, um, maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, Activision, seeing as Activision is now going to be under Microsoft, there's no reason that Activision cannot continue to work with some cert, with some of the Sony people, you know, and we know that 2K and Ubisoft and EA and THQ Nordic are willing to work with companies outside of their um, uh, publishing house, you know. Um, what was it? Um, the Collective, uh, Microsoft's uh, first party first party studio, The Collective, are currently working on um, Perfect Dark, a reimagining of Perfect Dark. I would like to actually see that because I enjoyed that. Yeah, there, but they brought in a company to help with that, which. Uh, is a third-party uh, developer for PlayStation. They almost exclusively produce games for PlayStation. So there's, you know, if for the collective to bring in a company that, while it's not owned by Sony, they almost exclusively make stuff for Sony. Right. You know, it, it's proof that this this whole idea of console wars is ridiculous. Yeah. So we're in a unique position. And especially in now that Sony has started, um, albeit I've heard they're not the best, that they are starting to port some games to the PC side. Mm. Oh, that yeah, the yeah, I, the the thing that disappoints me with that is that the company, the games that they're porting over, some of them have ported over quite well. Um. What was that? Uh, that one. Uh, it's all about AI and uh, robotics. And Horizon. No, not Horizon. It's the the one where you play as the robots. And um, oh, it wasn't Heavy Rain, right? No, not Heavy Rain. No, it was the one where you're Detroit. You, Detroit. Beca human. Yeah, become <laughs> human. Become, yeah. yeah, yeah, that. While the performance wasn't great, it transferred the the company that ported it did a very good job in terms of graphically. It's it blows the console out of the water. Like it it was amazing graphically. Like it was a really well done game. But then you've got something like Final Fantasy VII remake that the console version is so much better than the PC version. The PC version is a complete messy hole that people have been asking for refunds from. Some uh, games, uh, I don't. I think we were talking about it with Des earlier, some games are better made for the console whilst uh, mm. uh, well, instead of the PC beca because of the porting yeah, well, issue. Well, the, the thing with that is that it's. I don't think that is a porting issue because this is a game made by Square Enix who make mm. an awful lot of PC games. Mm. I think it's a matter of laziness, mm. which is a real well, problem. It, yeah, it, it kind of makes me laugh because Des has had a lot of problems with some of his some of the earlier Assassin's Creed games that he streamed. Mm -hmm. Um, he's had to go in and modify his PC a lot to Just run to get it. to work, yeah. And now they're coming out on the Switch. Yeah, and they work but, as well as they did on the, the, the 360 when they came out on the 360 or the PS3 on the Switch. And yeah, it, it's, it's silly. It's... They're... Sony are getting better at PC games, um, but they've still got a long way to go. I think they they really need to. It, it's good that they've now got a PC com uh, a PC porting company that's dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I look forward to Ghost of Tsushima coming out. Sony, Ghost of Tsushima, please. Um, <laughs> I don't that want to have to buy. Game. Yeah, that I don't. Mm -hmm. I yeah, don't want to. It. Yeah, I, I don't want to have to buy a PlayStation Five just to play one game. I'm sorry, I don't have the money for that. Um, <laughs> please just the, um, release it on PC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we watched somebody play it, and uh, I think 
on the on their channel, and it was the one game we just without fail used yeah, to come and watch him play. The whole thing, watch them play the whole thing, which. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's different endings. Yeah, as there's well. a lot of different endings. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Like, branching story, right? But like, and that that one came out of left field because they never expected that one to do well. Yeah. Sony Sony actually yeah. didn't market it. Yeah. Um, the and way they so, marketed Horizon so Zero Dawn. What and... Punch had done before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it it is coming to Steam. Um, uh, they've they've announced it will be release date twenty twenty two. Yeah. Um, but it it's yeah it, it's interesting that I think that's the thing that that catches a lot of publishers. They don't realize, and I think that's the thing that Microsoft this generation is doing really well. Microsoft have basically said this generation, do what you want, make the games you want. Whereas last generation, Microsoft were, oh, well, Halo's the only one that's successful. Release another Halo game. Yeah. Um, You know, Gears of War is the only one that's successful. Release another Gears of War game. Whereas the Coalition... Don't necessarily want to do another Gears of War game. You know, they want to go and work on their own stuff. You know, or Call of Duty exactly with Activision. Activision, it was oh well, uh, we've only sold seven million units of this game. We'll just scrap the the series off. It's like with Square Enix with Deus Ex. Deus Ex sold four and a half million copies in the first week. And they said they weren't doing well. And they said that's not doing good enough. We're going to can that one and go and work on more Final Fantasy games. Hmm. It's like, for a start, Deus Ex does not have the fan base that Final Fantasy has. It's a niche right. game, you know. But the fact that it's, uh, done as well. I mean, it literally in the first week outsold Call of Duty that year. Uh, Mankind Divided outsold Call of Duty in its first week. And yet Square Enix turned around and went, yeah, we're just going to can that series now. It didn't do as well as we'd hoped. It's like, are you ridiculous? Like, what? You know? And it's it's like when a bank says, oh, we only made 20 billion profit this year, so we're going to have yeah. to hike interest rates. It's like, hold on. You made 20 billion profit. Right. That's profit not you only had 20 billion come in and you lost money on that if you'd lost money then yes that would be a raise interest rates but you know it's it's this this whole we've got to have constant growth thing is killing the games industry at the moment because there's too many um accountants involved and not enough gamers involved yeah. And that's where I think this is important. We need gamers to step forward and say, look, if you want to go back and do an old uh, game, these are the games that we enjoyed. You know, We want to see Manhunt brought back, Might and Magic, Morrowind, Outcasts, you know, Spec Ops, The Line. You know, I mean, these are well, games look, that influenced us. Look at how many games that people play using emulators. Because oh, yeah. that's the only way they can play them. Yeah. Mm. And why can't we take, you know, Echo the Dolphin and bring it up to the 4K generation? You know, why can't we have a new uh, Silent Hill game? You I know? would like to see uh, these games brought back so people now of this generation can see where their games they love now came from yeah. exactly exactly mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's uh, like for me as a kid i used to play on the zx spectrum manic minor was the yes, precursor all to all platform, platform games, games. Mm-hmm. yeah manic minor from manic minor spawned you know mario and sonic and all of those games wouldn't have existed without manic minor you know, so why can't we have, you know, rather than just re-release Manic Miner for the millionth time, release, actually release the original. work on the oh, original, take mm-hmm. the original design, uh, the, the, the original design document, and make a new game with it that is Manic Miner. 
Yeah. You know? um, in terms of, as I say, I was going to try and give these games all a score. It's hard though, but isn't it? Cause I I couldn't, I can't do it because because everyone has spoken so lovingly about yeah, their games. Like, uh, as I say, uh, as I was saying to um, Summer of Spec Ops: The Line, I saw that announced at E3, the year it was re- the, the year before it was released, and I saw it. and I was like, yeah, that looks really good, but there was so much out at the time that I never got to play it. You know, um, and. Similarly, you know, uh, I never got to play Legend of Dragoon because I didn't have a PlayStation at the time. You know, if Ghost of Tsushima is not released on uh, PC later this year, I'll never get to play Ghost of Tsushima unless PlayStation come out with 19 other games that I want to get on PlayStation. I was uh, very late to see Because that's my the limit for consoles. PlayStation. The first time... I've seen PlayStation in the shops and that... The first time I ever got to play on a PlayStation was on a PS4, and that was uh, one of your friends at university. Yeah, he bought a... Um, it wasn't PS4, it was PS3. Oh, that was it. And we were playing... Um, Soul Calibur. Ninja Gaiden. And I... No, it was Soul back- Calibur. Oh, God, that Soul game Calibur. is so hard. It was Soul Calibur. It was Soul Calibur 4, <laughs> because the PlayStation version had... Um, Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yes. Darth Vader, whereas the Xbox version had Yoda. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, was... you could only ever play as Yoda on the Xbox version. You could only ever play as Darth Vader on the PlayStation version. Did it Nintendo have Spawn? Uh, yeah, Did Nintendo it... had Spawn, and it was so aggravating because Spawn was so much stronger than any of the other characters. <laughs> Like, Yoda was good. You couldn't hit Yoda. And Darth Vader was strong. He hit hard. But Spawn had it all. Spawn was unstoppable. Um, but yeah, the, like that was the first time we really got to play on a PlayStation. It was He brought that round. And it, it, I don't have a problem with PlayStations and things like that. I find the controller a bit weird because I'm used to my thumbs being in a different position. Right. You know, than... Right. With the PlayStation uh, thumbsticks. Um, well, the the only reason yeah. I'm gonna get to play, I'm sorry, Summer. Um, the only reason I'm gonna get to play um, Horizon Forbidden West is because they've released it on PS4. Because people are having such a hard time getting PlayStation Five. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's still so damn difficult. I know uh, Bev does gaming. Finally, got him one. But scalpers are trying to sell them on New Egg for like eight ninety nine for just a console and a game. Mm. <laughs> eight ninety nine, nine hundred dollars. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I yeah. wish we could give you the ones from here because we've got so many in stock in Northern Ireland. We're 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 fairly in stock for Series Xs. We do not have many PS fives in Northern Ireland. Well, at least we have some. We have a couple, Which is but they're not one. they're not as easy to get as the Series X. It's yeah. it's weird. Northern Ireland had we keep getting gluts of Series X's with, like, a couple of PS5's coming, and they all sell at the price that they're supposed to sell, which is great. But there's people here who have taken to buying them and selling them uh, abroad. Oh, yeah. You know? Uh, And it's... I think this is... Microsoft and Sony need to learn from this, and they need to make it so that in the future... Um, when they release a new yeah. console, they need to make it so that it's you have to. Arm. Have... Oh, it's your wife's arm. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Mr. Corn. Mr. Corn, you can see my wife's arm. <laughs> Hello. Hey. <laughs> but... And the U.S. The U.S. needs to learn that we need to make shit here instead of outsourcing everything to <laughs> China and Korea yeah. and wherever else mm-hmm. our ships are made. Yeah, well, that's no, people a... are people are price gouging cat food. Well, there good. is a huge, huge shortage. I don't, summer. I don't know if you've run into this or not, but it, it is so hard to find canned cat food. That Sorry, was that was with the drivers outside. outside. Nitty was just flipping the drivers off outside. Oh, she wasn't flipping them yeah. off. 
I was. It was actually the Domino's. Yeah, it, it, it looked like that he was going yeah, at everyone, which she wasn't. It, was the, the driver, <laughs> it is literally the Domino's drivers because we live on top of Domino's. Yeah, we literally live on top of Domino's. We live right. on top of Domino's. Yeah. The apartment building on top of Domino's, and the drivers sit outside with their cars running, mm-hmm. and their air conditioner pulls in all the exhaust. Mm-hmm. And, the and, 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 and the pot smoke. Stuff. <laughs> you know, we got there a smoke pot, and it, it sucks it right into the apartment. But the, the, this, this is, is to, uh, uh, you guys, you guys see, see, I, 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 I yeah. that, yeah. Am I forgiven? Am I forgiven? Yes. Right back at you. Absolutely. Yay! All right. So oh, in gosh. closing, I think, okay. out of the list of games that we've given, that we looked at tonight, I cannot think of one that I wouldn't like to see redone. Um, Going to the list now. Honestly, mm-hmm. I think it would be it would be great to see Black and White, Deus Ex, Enchanted Arms, Legacy of Cain, Legend of Dragoon, Manhunt, Might and Magic, Morrowind, Outcast, Phantom Crash, Spec Ops: The Line, Stubbs the Zombie, The Suffering, and Too Human, redone, not mm. remastered. We don't look Ubisoft. EA, Activision, Sony, Microsoft, all of you motherfuckers out there, including you, Tencent, we don't want remasters. We want remakes. Redo them. Bring them in and bring the technology up. Because a remaster, you end up, as I say with Outcast, Outcast is a fantastic example. For the time it was made, it was revolutionary. It was amazing. It was a great game. And when you remaster the graphics, yes, the graphics look better, but the gameplay is still 1999 gameplay. It's still clunky. The animations are still, you know, weird. doesn't matter how good the texture quality is. The animations are still going to, you know, hey, I'm going to go whack, 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 you know. It's not what we want. What we want is remakes. Keep the story. Keep the but... story, sure. Use the, yeah. the story as the basis to launch that game into the stratosphere. But the story is what made the game so popular back yeah. then. Why it right. became a cult game. Yeah, we, we, we I... weren't fans of the crappy gameplay. We weren't fans of the crappy graphics. We were fans of the storyline. Yeah. Mm. Storyline. Yeah. sucked in. Yeah. Another thing um, I'd like to see... Uh, Sorry, uh, go ahead. But oh, sorry. I was just yeah. say, uh, w- w- one example I had of the older games, and they, they, they did release a bunch of the old games. Um, Rare did that Rare replay where it was like all their old games mm-hmm. on current consoles, and I remember loading up Conqueror's oh. Bad Fur Day, and I was like, it's still single joystick movement, and I'm, I'm I kept catching myself trying to use my right joystick to look around. Like, damn, they did not bring that up to date. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry, you were saying something. That is a lewd game. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very lewd game. Yeah, Summer, you were saying something? It's like, uh, my wife was bringing it up all ago when I was talking about what we were doing. She like, what she'd like to see come back, me too, is, you know, co op games like they used to, like Mario Bros. I don't know, just all those co op games you could sit there, two player on the same screen. Side by side, oh, it's co-op. And you just play. Straight up mm-hmm. co-op. Mm-hmm. Play each other's on the same screen. Uh, they just don't make those games that a lot. Because they know they can sell more consoles and more copies of the game if it's all online. Online do uh, op, you know. Some <clears> consoles <throat> actually do have couch co-op games. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was that game that Eli was playing on the PC. Uh, the... Um, one, one with the zombies, zombies in it. In it. Dismantle. Uh, Dismantle. Dismantle, yeah. That that's a couch co-op yeah, game. So, have a look at that one if you haven't. That one's a very fan. Uh, very I'll good send couch you a link. Uh, okay. Another good one is Nobody Saves the World. Yeah. Um, if you guys haven't seen that one, um, the graphics are. It's by the same guys who did Guacamole. Um. It's a very funny game. It's a great couch co-op. It's something you can just pick up, run around, beat some shit out of some bad guys, and then 
you know, close the game down and relax for a little while, you know. Um, but yeah. Uh, I forget what console it's on, but there's also one called It Takes Two. Yeah, and that's, you uh, have to that's play PlayStation it. 2. Oh. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I was really interested in it. I watched uh, Neves Gaming. They did a little special with, uh, I think it was Espro and I believe Neves, one of them. Mm. Anyway, they did a little playthrough with that, and I was like, man, that game looks looks awesome, really. Mm. I think it'd be something me and her can play together. We like to play mm. that um, Sackboy, Big Adventures, or Little Big mm. Planet back on PlayStation 3. We played those a lot. But <clears throat> as far as like coming a, out soon, is it? I'll say again. Uh, there's another Sackboy coming out, uh, little, little Big Planet coming out oh. um, next year. I think so. Yeah, because they got the Tech Boy Big Adventure now for the PlayStation Five, and it came out. Mm. I think they're gonna, like she said, uh, they're releasing all the games basically for both PS4 and Five, mm. because people can't get a PS5 very easily, mm. and that's the shortage or whatever. That's I don't know. I think it's kind of bullshit anyway, because we can have more than one company making our chips. Yeah, I guess. But mm. all we all got to get it from one place, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it's but. the current the current situation with um the market for not just consoles, it's PC components, it's cars, it's microwaves, yeah. washing machines, everything. Boxes. Yeah. It's everything. Anything is, that's computerized, basically. Anything that is computerized, we're in a, an awful situation. And it just demonstrates how Dependent. delicate we are in terms of a society on everything. I mean, um, we talk about the, you know, the, the dependence on electronics at this point. It's got to the point now where, you know, even if something shut down just for a week, the knock-on effects of that last for months. Oh, yeah. And they're talking about chip shortages until 2025. Mm. They've literally, the US has opened three new mega factories to produce chips that won't be up and running until 2026. Um, China has opened up some more. England has opened up some more. France and Germany have both opened up these chip factories. And it's going to take years before they're, we're seeing the, the chip production. Um, but I mean, I think that you were talking about, um, uh, maintaining games in the long run. I think that's one of the things, uh, that I'm happy and disappointed with Microsoft over. I'm happy that they're doing it, you know, this whole backwards compatibility. You know, right. being able to play your OG Xbox games and your 360 games and your Xbox One games is a fantastic thing. I love that. Um, I, I wish Steam would do something like that. You know, make sure that games that are on the Steam pages work yeah. on the PC, you know, uh, with modern PCs. Um, like, I, I, I love the fact that Microsoft are doing that to a certain extent. But I'm also disappointed they're not doing it more. You know, um, for instance, as Nitty was saying, um, Phantom Crash was backwards compatible on the 360. It's not backwards compatible on the Xbox One or the Xbox Series X, um, which is ridiculous. It should be. If it was backwards compatible on the 360, it should be backwards compatible now. Yeah. Um, and I, I get that there's a certain amount of licensing involved and that licensing deals run out, especially with driving games. Um, for instance, the original Forza Motorsport that was on the original Xbox cannot be backwards compatible because the licensing deals they had with Porsche and with BMW ran out you know, right. 15 years ago. And because of that, uh, they can't sell the game anymore um but yeah it, it's i i think that's where the remaking of games comes in you know rather than remastering rather than re-releasing i mean there's only so many times that you can buy fucking halo 
there's only so many fucking times oh that my you, God. you want oh to yeah. rebuy Street Fighter, uh, you know, like, how many times has Street Fighter 2 been re-released now? Like, good lord. It's re-released, even within the same generation. Like, I remember Street Fighter 2 being released on the Xbox One four different times. Mm. And that was just within the Xbox One generation. You know, and they've re-released it for the Series X, and they 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 had it on the 360, and they you know they, they it's you don't need to re-release these games. Stop being so lazy and yeah, re-release them. Out with turn them and yeah. Mortal Kombat thirteen was it or ten? Eleven. Ten I don't was remember. the uh, eleven was the last way one. up there. I was yeah. really excited about it, and I pre-ordered it and everything, and went in, got the game, traded it in the next day. I was so disappointed. I was heartbroken that this game I'd been so excited about, and Eli couldn't get me to shut up for loving the money about the game, and then that was it. I was like, I'm not doing it again. I'm not getting another one. Yeah, there's a lot of... As I say, uh, that this it, uh, that's one of the things that killed Call of Duty for me, mm. is that it was the same game engine that released Call of Duty 3 was used to make every Call of Duty game up until, um, I think, not the last one, but the one previous, previous to the last one, not Vanguard, but the one previous to that. And that's the first time they actually updated the engine properly you know and again it it's this matter of it's it's this constant need to only put out the successful games you know um and i think that's where microsoft have really stepped out of their bounds this this generation they've gone okay well you know you guys want to work on this you work on it if you want to work on a, a, a new ip run for it you know we don't care what you make we want you to make games, and we want to make games that you want to play. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, doesn't that have a lot Sony to do are getting with the that leadership now. change in Microsoft? Yeah, yeah. With Microsoft, it's a ma- it, it. The problem with Microsoft is in the Xbox One generation. Um, Steve uh, Ballmer took over Microsoft, and before Ballmer took over Microsoft, Bill Gates said, "Here's a hundred and fifty mi- billion dollars." Um, for Xbox, go and invest that any way you want. You know, spend it spend it on games companies, spend it on developing technology, whatever you want to do. There's 150 billion dollars. Just go and spend that on whatever you want. Steve Ballmer took over, and he took that 150 billion dollars and he put a lock on it and said, "We'll make more money if we just leave it accruing interest." And so Microsoft went from this position at the end of the 360 era where they'd basically exploded onto the scene. You know, um, they'd gone from the test run, which was the OG Xbox, which sold 20 million units, you know, that or 15 million units. That was pretty good. Then the 360 came around, and the 360 was 76 million units worldwide for the Xbox 360. That was crazy increase. You know, like that was that actually had PlayStation worried, which is why PlayStation went all out with a PS4 um, in terms of supporting, um, you know, companies and paying money to companies to ensure that they got exclusives because they were so scared by the 360. And then the Xbox One came out and Microsoft had got no money to spend. And the leadership at Microsoft were of the opinion that you know, games consoles can't make money. They need to release a media box. And gamers aren't interested in media. Sure, we like our consoles to be able to watch YouTube. We like our consoles to be able to watch Netflix. But that's more of a, it would be nice to have, rather than that's what we want. Right. Good chicken to sit in the back seat. Yeah. Um. They they really screwed the pooch with the Xbox One, which was a real shame. Because mm-hmm. 
because there was a lot of technology in the Xbox One that never really got utilized until recently. Um, well, wasn't that the one also not only was it you had to be online? It, oh, yeah, you that, had to have the connect you with it. had to have the connect, you had to be connected online to play the games. And they had to backtrack on that so hard. It nearly made us not get the Xbox. Yeah, it nearly killed the Xbox for us. We nearly switched over to PC because of that, because we didn't have internet a lot of the time. And uh, whenever we went up to Eli's parents, well, their internet, it's dial-up. Well, it was dial-up. Yeah, it was dial-up. You know, so there was no way in hell we'd be able to play. It was a a silly decision, you know. Um, So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I... Sony kind of lost their way towards the end of the PS4 generation. Um, they started screwing over indie developers. And you'll, you, you see that now. A lot of indie developers don't want anything to do with Sony at the moment. Um, because of the way they treated them um, towards the end of the PS4 generation. Um, ooh, chocolate milk. Ooh, chalky milk. Ooh, I mm, said. Yum. Um, now, I was one of those indie devs with Sony, and I saw the way they were treating people back in the PS3 Tell them days. how much that they wanted to charge you for coming up with a game. Yeah. Um, I was looking to make an AI dev kit, and so I wanted a game that I wanted to see how much it would be to make a game to release on um, Xbox, Nintendo, it was the Wii at the time, it was the 360, the Wii, and the PS3. And I went to Microsoft and I said, hey, I want to make a game to release on the 360 as an indie game. It's going to be the basis of an AI toolkit that I can then use in other games. Microsoft said, yeah, no worries. I said, okay, how much would a dev kit cost? And they were like, it's free. I was like, okay, and how much support will I get with that? And Microsoft said, you will get, you know, as much support as a company your size will need. You know, we'll be there 24 hours a day. If you have a problem, contact our customer support, and we'll have a technician sit and work, walk you through and try and get it working. It's like, okay, cool. Contacted Nintendo. Nintendo said, um, dev kit will cost you $5,000. And I said, okay, well, what support will I get with that? And they said, you will get 24-hour support. You will get, uh, you phone up. You'll get put in a waiting line if there's a waiting line. But if there is no waiting line, you'll get put through to a technician. And that technician will walk you through and ensure that your game is working on the Nintendo platform. Uh, I I, I said to Microsoft and Nintendo, you know, so, okay, if I release a game on your platform, can I then release that game on another platform? Having used your development kits to develop the games. Nintendo and Microsoft, absolutely. You know, which is was wild for Nintendo at the time because traditionally, Nintendo, if you made a game for Nintendo, you could only release that game on Nintendo. Right. You know, um, so it was a big step up, uh, the Wii generation for Nintendo. And then I went to Sony and I said, hey, I, I'm, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Sony said, okay, yeah, no worries. Yeah, yeah. Um, the dev kit's going to cost you 25000 Oh, my God. And I was like... Triple. Wow, 25000 over Nintendo's 5000 and Microsoft's free. Okay. And what dev support do I get with that? And they said, Oh, you don't get dev support. That's just so that you can release a game con a game on our ecosystem. And I said, okay, well, can I then use that dev kit to make a game and release it on Microsoft and Nintendo? No, not unless you're willing to pay us a further hundred and twenty-five thousand. Oh my god! And a lot of other games companies and other games developers I know of have been put in the same situation. To the point where there was one company um, made a hugely successful indie game on PlayStation. Um, And it was hugely successful in that it was 
you know, rave reviews. Everyone was saying it's one of the greatest games ever made. And the amount of money they've made off the PlayStation sales only just covers the cost of the dev kits to make the game and the money they had to pay Sony for advertisement. For every uh, one game sold, they've made $1 despite the game selling for $15 a game. Uh, which Sony are starting to change. They're starting to get better again. They're starting to go the other way. Um, Didn't they change some um, some people over there? I can't remember who all. If there's yeah. Any. Yeah, they, they fired a up. lot of people. And, well, I, I say fired. Moved them on. <laughs> you um, the yeah, you've been promoted. Away. Go work in the television department. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, and it's the, it's the same thing that happened at Microsoft when Phil Spencer took over uh, at Xbox Games. You know, um, all the people that were no good for the console were quietly promoted out of the door or side moved out of the door. Um, one of them, um, was it Don Matic, ended up going and working at EA. Um, he was basically thrown out um, un unceremoniously. Phil Spencer, I, I like to imagine that Phil Spencer kicked the door open, grabbed Don Matic by his underpants, lifted them up, dragged him out, wedging him over his shoulder, and then threw him out the window. Um, because the speed at which he went from head of Xbox to, oh, I'm now in EA. <laughs> was um it was wow i mean i've i've never seen anyone's um browser set fire leaving an office before but don maddock was on fire when he left that office um i think it was don maddock it was one of those guys anyway it was one of the it was the head of the previous head of xbox uh, it might have even been matt booty stupid fucking dude anyway yeah yeah but um yeah, and I'm I'm glad to see it. I like to see the fact that Sony are opening up to more. Uh, they're starting to realize that they can make a lot more money working with the competition than against. It feels like um, and that they, uh, I think, realized at, they they were at such a point that they realized if they didn't do anything, um. They that they would lose everything. They, would lose so they out, had yeah. to. They, they basically forced them themselves. They made. They, yeah. They could have done it without having that um, realization that if we don't do anything, it's gonna be too late. Yeah, I think the the big kick for Sony was I don't think Sony expected the kickback from their "We believe in generations" comment when they came out and said "We believe in generations." Any game made for the PS5 will not be on the PS4. I don't think they realized how much of a fuck you to their fans that was. Uh, yeah. And I am so yeah. glad that they put they um, clawed that back. Yeah, I mean, that's stupid. I mean, even when PS3 or PS2 or whatever came out, yeah. they were, you could get them for both games. Even when yeah. Destiny 1 or 2, whichever one, came mm -hmm. out for PS3. I got a code for my PS4 when I got it. If you get PS3 Destiny, you get a free upgrade to PS4. Yeah. For Destiny 1 or 2, whichever one. Mm -hmm. And I used it when I got my PS4. I used that damn free code and got my damn Destiny on my PS4. And me and my wife mm -hmm. played both games. They're the same game on two different consoles. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked. So then they, then they came out when they first said it. So no, it won't be cross or back compatible or whatever. And it's like, excuse me? Mm -hmm. But now, like you said, they they went back on that and said, "Well, if we're going to yeah, make they're it, clawing we're back on it. They haven't Mark done Ryan? it perfectly because they're still what is it? Is it uh, Horizon New West where um there's a current mm, you can play if you buy the PS4 version, you get the PS5 version, but only if you buy the deluxe edition. But if you buy the deluxe edition of the PS4 version, it costs, what is it, $53? Mm -hmm. 
And if you buy the PS5 Dulux Edition, it costs $63. So it's like, okay, then I'm going to just buy the PS4 version and get the Dulux Edition <laughs> free on the PS5? Why would, <laughs> why would I spend another 10 bucks to get something that then won't work on my PS4? You know, um, Should my PS5, for some reason, be taken over by someone else in the house you know which happens mm -hmm. um but yeah i think uh they they made so many missteps that were it's not so much that the competition were doing things differently it's that they were missteps against their own player base and i'm yeah. so glad that sony started doing it and then went oh fuck you know, as they fired a load of people, sorry, promoted a load of people, <laughs> um, the the people that they left behind kind of were going, no, see, what we're doing here is wrong. You know, it's a bad state of affairs when Nintendo were more customer focused. And Nintendo are awful for customer service. They're yeah. awful for customer focus. Nintendo have a vision. Nintendo are sticking to that vision, come hell or high water. Um, out of all, out of all the the consoles that I'm aware of, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but Nintendo is the least accessible of all of them. Yeah, and they don't have any plans to be any more accessible than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they don't believe in... They believe in making a product that is cookie-cutter, only works for people that fit inside that square box. If you're outside that square box, if your hands are too big, if you've only got one arm, if you, you're visually impaired, if you have auditory issues, if you don't fit inside that box, they're not selling a console to you. Right. Now, rightly or wrongly, that's that's their choice as a company mm -hmm. um but it's it's it, it's amazing how nintendo went from being the number one console producer to you know their third place in consoles yeah. and they're about to be fourth place behind steam deck you know that's crazy. Uh, I mean, i've never seen anybody use a stream deck yeah um but it, didn't it, that just come out within the last couple of days? I think it's not even out yet. I think that there's there's occasional units in the wild for preview. Okay, okay. Previews, but because I thought I had just seen a YouTube review on it. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of YouTube reviews on it. As I say, there's been a lot of um, previews going out there. And Steam Deck, I, I I'm uh, amazed that Microsoft have turned around and said, hey. Uh, uh, or Steam have turned around and said, hey, we'd love you to bring oh, Game cool. Pass to Steam Deck. And that's a third fluffy cat? <laughs> Good yeah. lord. Oh, there's a so third, that's the third I... one? There's four fluffy cats in total. Okay, I got four. Oh. The other one doesn't like me or anyone else. Ah. So oh, see. This one's Kit Kat. Oh, he's a fluffy kitty. He's just a fluffy kitty. Oh, look at that. Oh, they're under the chin scritchels. Oh. It's the best ever. <laughs> is, that a, is that a flat faced kitty? Uh, this one, no. She's a long haired exotic. Uh, uh, the face. other one, the orange one, is a flat face. It has no nose. I call her Smash Mouth. Hmm. <laughs> but her real name, the orange one, is uh, Rita Catentire because she's red. Oh, I love that. <laughs> the black one is called Back Roads Rufy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Summer's Discord. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the orange one there. Mm -hmm. Uh and uh and then there's the uh the other one that we saw just a bit earlier. Yeah. You gotta uh, love a one. man that I don't loves remember what don't oh Kit Kat, yeah, no. That's Kit Kat yeah, there. Kit yeah. Kat. yeah. Yeah. The other one's yeah. uh <clears throat> Rocket. Yeah. Rocket, that's the one, yeah. yeah. Rocket. Yeah. But uh yeah, I think I think it's about time that games de games developers stop listening to the accountants mm -hmm. and go back to what they were. Because yeah. 
if you make a game that is fun, it will be profitable. Yeah. Yeah. And stop if, pushing them to release a game when they're not done cooking. Good Lord, yes. Digital extremes, yeah, digital extremes are... After some trouble they had with their um, uh, financial advisors, they ended up base giving them the middle middle, middle finger and said, "We're going to do this when we're, when we when we feel the thing is ready, it will be released. Yeah. If it gets put back, then it gets yeah, put they, back." But they they were in financial difficulty because they were working on this current uh, storyline that they've just released, and they weren't ready to release it. And the financial backers at the time were like, oh, well, you've got to release it now. Release it right now. And Digital Extremes went, oh, okay. Well, I can't quite hear you over the sound of Tencent giving us a bunch of money so that we can get this thing working. Okay, bye. (laughs) And And now they're owned by... Now they're 51% owned by Tencent. So... Um, and look how popular that uh, yeah, DLC the, the DLC amazing became. Amazing DLC, really good, and it's opened the door to so much more. I've but, heard nothing but good reviews yeah, about it. I, I think, as I say, I think it's about time. You know, I mean, if you make a game to be profitable, it's not necessarily going to be fun, and it's not necessarily going to sell well. Mm. And it's definitely not going to review well. The lowest reviewed games are all made for profit. Mm. You know, um, what is it? Madden, NFL. um, One of the lowest rated games of all time. And it's purely made for profit. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, whereas games that are made by companies for fun. You know, like I might not like Horizon Zero Dawn. But the company that made it didn't make it for profit. They made it because it was a passion project. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Ghost of Tsushima was a passion project. Sony didn't think that was going to sell very well. They actually didn't even advertise it properly. They were just like, ah, you know, this game's not going to be that popular. It's not going to be that fun. Um we're not that interested in it. It's fine. It's not our usual wheelhouse. Sure, it might have a niche market, but it's not going to be that big of a game. That game blew the doors off Sony's expectations. Yeah, it did. I mean, even with the uh, Days Gone, mm-hmm. when it was coming out, they advertised the shit out of it. Oh my god, look mm-hmm. at this! There's an E3. Everybody's. Not... <clears throat> I was looking forward to it. I was like, man, come on, come on, bring it out. And they had that big crane yard scene he's running mm-hmm. and dodging and shit and ghost of shima just came out here's your game yeah and he's, he's ghost shima of shima. Now told him you know yeah yeah blue blue days gone out the water um and i love days gone but, uh, i i think a lot of the problem with days gone is they advertised it so much and they they used all of the cut scenes from the game to advertise it rather than the actual gameplay itself so people yeah. were expecting the cut scenes to be the gameplay and right. that was what that's what put me off was i that was actually one of the games i wanted to get and was on my list of games once i hit 20 games i'll buy a playstation right and that was one of the games and then i saw someone playing it and i was like wow that's actually nothing like what they advertised it as you know, it's not what they advertised. It's not this, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd go so far as to say that World War Z did a better job of matching what they showed in the cutscenes in Days mm. Gone to what you actually played in day, in World War Z. If you haven't played World War Z, that scene where the guy's running through the, the, um, the, the dockyard, I remember that at E3 because that was the moment I was like, oh, I'd love to play that. That looks amazing. For days gone, and then, and then in World War Z, they've literally got a scene where you're running through the dockyard, and there's a literal wall of zombies <laughs> just bearing down on you, and you have to turn around and just fire into this wall of meat that's just rolling towards you. Like the like in the movie World War Z. Like in the movie, and World you World see War the Z. wall of zombies oh, yeah. climbing Building up, up that the walls. Wall. It's fantastic. It's it's really well done. And I think that that's why I'd like to see Days Gone get a sequel. Because the company that made it wants to do a sequel. 
They want to do Days Gone 2. They want to do a remake of Days Gone because they know that they could do a much better job of it this time around. But Sony are like, oh no, Ghost of Tsushima did much better. We just, we, we'll just leave yeah. Days Gone as it. And it's like, no, don't. No, Days Gone has the potential to be amazing. I mean, but, personally, I played the game. I'm still playing it. I haven't beat it yet because I don't really have oh, a lot of time. But to me, mm-hmm. I, I love the game. I love the storyline with it. Was it what they advertised in the beginning? No, it had its bugs, of course. Mm-hmm. Everything starts with bugs. And these but, days, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, work, but <clears throat> no, not even these know, days. I take that back. Games have always released with bugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just it's gotten worse. So the past few years. Oh, yeah, it's it, a whole it, lot worse. Yeah, the, the, the last couple of years have been games have released in a completely unplayable state. So, um, mm-hmm. that game I was so disappointed. What was that other one? Fallout something stick. 76 really opened up. My God. I like it. It still makes me want to throw up. We haven't played it in a while. We bought it. We bought the fucking Ultimate Edition versions. Me and my wife. She got her, had to go out and buy another PlayStation 4 just so she can have it. And mm-hmm. We went all out. I got the fucking Helmet Edition and we got it. We were so fucking disappointed. We were so mm-hmm. pissed off. We played it. We tried to play it. We just played it out of anger. You know, fuck it. We put all this money in. We're going to play it. And uh, we just laid it down, and finally they came out with your own. Uh, it's like 100 bucks or 50 bucks a year to get your own server, the private server, or whatever. That way, you and whoever you want on that server can come play it. So then we picked it back up, played all the other stuff that came with that, and it was pretty fun. And of course, we haven't played it again in a while. Mm. But now there's more upgrades for it, and I think you can actually get NPCs, you can do storylines, stuff like that. I also do like that if the host crashes, the server won't shut off for like 20 minutes. So you have a good 20 minutes to finish up a quest that you're doing, or the host will come back, and if they come mm. back, the server will stay up without being interrupted. You, you're the one that's played it the most out of all of us, Steph. Mm. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I don't have the time to really like go into it, which is what I want. Because right now I'm like really stuck on Dying Night 2. Um, mm. But I will say, I like where it's at. And like, I know a lot of people were mad when it came out. And I was like, they, they were so mad because they were like, there's nothing to do. And I was like, but they told you that you're going to be the first ones out of the vault. There's no civilizations yet. It's going to be bare, but it's going to build over time. And it kind of has built over time. I, yeah, I, I, th- like I think if they'd left that game a year, and after a year of the a year after when they actually released it but included all the content they'd released over that year i think fallout 76 would have had a better reception oh it would have been fantastic um but that when they released it it really was i mean for a start me and Nitty can't play it we tried to play it on a 1x and something about the frame rate on the one x just makes us feel physically sick and we've since gone back to play it yeah nitty literally she played it for five minutes and had to go to the bathroom and throw up she got such bad motion sickness from it um we've seen it played on a one s and it didn't have those issues it seems like the worse the quality machine was the better it played wow um Whereas I've since gone back and played it on the one X, uh, on the Series X, and yes, it's a lot better than it was on the One X, but I got about an hour's gameplay, and then I was like, "Yeah, I'm starting to feel queasy. <laughs> I'm gonna have to stop." Um, it's just something to do with that game. I don't know what it is. I've tried cranking the um, field of view up, uh, doing all the usual kind of stop you feeling sick playing the game kind of stuff but that game something about it something about the frame rate something about the refresh rate makes me feel sick it makes me think of the original borderlands game i don't know if any of you guys ever you you go from a game that has a really high frame rate really high um uh sort of poll rate for the game you know um like really high fps and then you go and play borderlands one 
and it's jarring how much it makes you feel like you're going to vomit. Like, it's hardcore. Like, it, you have to play Borderlands 1 for a couple of hours before you're able to play Borderlands 1. <laughs> you know, it's such a, a weird game. Um, but uh, we shall carry on this discussion another time because we're going to uh, leave it there uh, as far as the YouTube side of this. I'm sure people will continue on with the, the chat afterwards. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone that came by uh, this evening. I'd like to thank uh, Dark Nisha for being the incredible mod boss that she always is. Uh, I'd like to thank the Midgard Zombie, a.k.a. Laka, for being awesome. I'd like to thank Wenchies for bringing all the snacks and the cucumbers. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Summer of Corn for being absolutely amazing and hosting us on Twitch this evening. Thank you kindly, sir. Very much appreciate Thank you, Summer. Um, I will announce our next subject um, in about a week to two weeks' time. Um, uh, it will be, again, something random. <laughs> uh, and picked off the top of my head but you will have until the 26th of March or whatever Sunday that falls on um, uh, Saturday that falls on at around about the same time and it will be released the following week on YouTube um, because I'm hoping to keep Grand Prix of Midgard as uh, we can sit and talk about stuff and try and stay within a kind of wheelhouse unlike the GGS sessions where it's just Let's just go with it, ladies and gentlemen, and do whatever we want to do. Um, but, uh, yes, I know there's weird hands coming in and attacking me. Anyway, take care. Look after yourselves, and as always, be good. Good night, everybody.